streaming. So, um, so for everybody on the call, just so you know, we, uh, we are live streaming this. Um, so that's uh, exciting. And we'll also be recording it so you can share it with other people later. Uh, but I'd like to welcome you all to, uh, to the 2021-2022 New Jersey Chapter GSEA Awards. Um, so let's go over today's agenda. Uh, really quick opening remarks. Uh, okay. Um, Sorry, very, very quick opening remarks. Um, then we're going to get right to the competition. Uh, looks like we have somebody else who needs to get in. Um, then we're going to get right to the competition. Um, each competitor will have half an hour. Um, we're going to take a 10 minute break. We're going to see the, the uh, second group of three competitors and uh, the judges will then finalize their scores. Uh, we will have a Q and A where our contestants can ask questions of the judges and then we will award our winners. So everybody on here probably knows what GSEA is, but I'm gonna take two seconds and go through it anyway. Uh, it is the competition for students who own and operate a business while they're in college. It is not a pitch competition. It is a competition for students with real businesses. In order to be part of this, a student either needs to have $500 in revenue for their business or $1,000 in investment. Um, this is, uh, an EO uh, initiative at this point. And um, I think it's super important because these students are our future. They're the people who are gonna make a difference. They're the people who are gonna change the world and we wanna support them as best we can. Uh, our prizes for this competition, uh, there will be for the first place winner, $2,000 in cash or um, e-currency, we added the e-currency at the insistence of one of our younger members because that appeals to young people, uh, which me and Mike don't know anything about. Um, I keep having people coming in. What's, do you guys know what's going on with that? Um, and then uh, a number of EO members and our sponsors have been kind enough to donate services and we specifically looked at services that will help uh, young entrepreneurs to move their business forward. So um, hopefully we have achieved that. Our second place winner will get $500 in cash. Um, and to the competitors, I really hope that you guys will take advantage of the uh, prizes that are being offered to you because that doesn't always happen. Um, we had uh, students from five colleges apply this year, which was fantastic. We had 12 applications. Um, we have six finalists. Our finalists are from Rutgers, Montclair, and Rowan. And we also had applicants from Princeton and Penn State this year. Uh, we wanna really give a big shout out to our referral partners. The hardest part of this competition is connecting with and finding students who have businesses and uh, letting them know about the competition so they can participate. And uh, Alfred Blake at Rutgers has been a longtime advocate and, uh, and helper, and we're super grateful for his help this year as we are every year. Um, and then Elizabeth Rich really uh, went above and beyond and Eric Begori at Rowan. So uh, thank you all. You guys are the ones that are really uh, making this work for us and for the students. Uh, real quick logistics. Um, after, in about a minute, after we're done here, all competitors are going to be placed in a breakout room. Uh, when it's their turn to present, they'll be added to the main room. Um, hopefully everybody knows the schedule by now, but two minutes to set up, 10 minutes to present, 10 minutes judges Q&A, and then six minutes for the judges to evaluate and record their feedback. And then we can luxuriate for two minutes before we start the next competitor. <laughs> Um, for the competitors, uh, we are going to try very hard to send a text to you uh, when it's five to seven minutes to go until you are, uh, until you are up, just to give you a heads up. Uh, but let's get to what this is all about, right? It's about our competitors. We have six uh, phenomenal students who have really great businesses. The businesses are in various stages um, and uh, 
I really want to make the competition about them. So we have uh, Jera, Sienna, Akash, Eri, Hassan, and Alex. And this is really just going to be about them being able to do their thing. And for our competitors, I just want you to know that all of our judges in this room are just here to help you succeed. Um, they want you to succeed. That may be the difference between this and Shark Tank. We're not trying to entertain anybody. We're not trying to make money. We are just trying to give you the best sort of feedback that we can. And with that, we're going to start our competition. So Steve, if you would be so good as to move all of our competitors except Jara over to uh, the breakout room. Jara, you can get ready. I'm not going to start your two minutes until everybody is over in the breakout room. Uh, but uh, um, just get, start getting yourself ready to go. And then Ed, do you have, Ed, I see you're on. Can you go over to the live stream? Yes, sorry. <laughs> yep, that'd probably be easier, thanks. You're trying no to keep the, the, the beeps down when people come in, thank you. No problem. All right, Earl, it looks like all of our students may be in the breakout room. All right, uh, terrific. Then, uh, Jara, I am going to, um, you should have the ability to share your screen. Um, Andrea, if we can start the two minute clock uh, for Jara's setup, that would be great. Jara, hey, can you confirm that you're actually here? And, uh, right here. There you are, okay, great. Um, and uh, whenever you're ready, you should yep. be able to take it over. Two minutes are starting now, just let me know when you're ready. Okay, give me a minute. Already? Um, okay, I, I think everything should be uh, good to go from here. And uh, I'm ready to begin if all the judges are ready to go. Um, all right, Andrea, if you okay. don't mind, please start okay. at 10 minutes. So your 10 minutes is going to start now. When you have um, two minutes, you'll get this. When you have one minute, you'll get this. Okay? Sure. Okay, begin. Hello, my name is Jared Siegel, and I'm the founder of Biodome LLC. Imagine you live in a city. You hop off the subway and after a long day at work, and from a block away, you can tell which building is yours because of the beautiful lit up domes on the roof filled with the green of plants and the bright colors of ripe produce. When you walk in the front door, the doorman greets you with a canvas bag filled with your favorite fruits and vegetables. Inside is a card with a special recipe that includes one of the vegetables in your bag. And on the other side, it explains exactly how the produce was grown and taken straight from your building's roof to you. No shipping in from Mexico or the Midwest, no chemicals from pesticides or preservatives for transportation, just fresh picked, healthy fruits and veggies. I am an entrepreneur by trade and an environmentalist at heart. At heart, entrepreneurship is not just what I do, but it's how I live my life. I've learned so many crucial things about entrepreneurship at both Rowan University and Hobart College, which apply to all aspects of life, like the difference between help and guidance. As entrepreneurs, we seek guidance from others in the field who have, uh, in order, who have succeeded in order to learn, grow, and succeed ourselves. But help is simply a one-time thing that someone does for you. I want to take a minute to thank everyone who has guided me along my journey with Biodome, because without them, I would not be where I am today. Biodome's story began my freshman year in an economics class talking about supply and demand. Immediately, I thought of the food industry since people always need to eat. This made me curious about how food was actually produced. So for the entire school year, I wrote every single paper for every single class on agricultural production methods and did somewhere between 500 and 700 hours worth of research. To figure out exactly how fruits and vegetables make it from a farm to grocery store to your house. As an environmentalist, I was appalled by the amount of energy and water used in our agricultural processes. The biggest use of energy came from shipping and processing, accounting for most of the energy in agriculture. So my plan was simple, just remove shipping and processing from the equation. 
indoor agriculture was my solution. And since I think big, naturally, my first thought was to build a sustainable skyscraper that would be able to feed an entire city. Weirdly enough, no one wanted to give a college sophomore just over a half a billion dollars to build one though. So I shrunk my idea down to two stories tall. And shortly after, I decided to go even smaller, thinking that the residential market might be a better starting point. I was accepted into the NSF i Customer Discovery Program through Hobart, where I conducted over 300 customer discovery interviews. My key takeaways were that biodomes were too expensive for the residential market, but I was given some great insights. People care about the environment. They like fresh produce. They want to know what goes into their food. And most importantly, they care about convenience. Biodome transitioned back into the commercial market as I transitioned from Hobart to Rowan. At Rowan, I entered the new venture competition where I was a finalist, but the judges were skeptical that my self-sustaining computerized greenhouse would even be possible to build. So I set out to prove them wrong. I took the money that I had made cutting lawns over the summer and I used it to build a biodome because despite what anyone else told me, I was going to make my vision a reality. I taught myself how to build a solar circuit and just enough coding to make a system that would grow plants. And I completed the first functional prototype in my parents' backyard. Once I had built the prototype, interest in my business skyrocketed, but I was left to make tough decisions between business and classes. I went from striving for straight A's to uh, just hoping to pass my classes so that I could spend the extra time developing my business. It was difficult to get my foot in the door with building owners, so I took any meetings I could get, even having to skip classes because that was the only available meeting time. And at the end of every meeting, I always asked the question, is there anyone else you think I should talk to? Because of this, I ended up talking to more than 30 building owners and property management groups, and I learned that they viewed their rooftops as dead space. I learned that Amenities yield building owners eight to 12 times cash flow, making them extremely desirable. And that building owners were already taking measures to improve sustainability within their buildings. Hearing this information, I knew that Biodome could be a perfect fit. We needed $20,000 for R&D to build a commercial unit, but I struck out at every pitch competition that year. So I used my knowledge of blockchain technology from a class I took and I made $26,000 trading cryptocurrency. Today, we're an LLC. I have three student engineers working for the company. We work with an outside engineering firm, have a small advisory board with members in key industries and are starting manufacturing. We're just months away from putting up a biodome unit as part of a sustainability initiative in Mount Laurel, New Jersey, near a farmer's market. And we are in touch with multiple property management companies about incorporating Biodome into their apartments. How does Biodome work? Well, our units are high-tech greenhouses, which use a computer system to grow plants by themselves. Additionally, they collect solar energy and rainwater, making our expenses extraordinarily low in, compar in comparison to other types of farming. We plan to build biodomes on top of apartment buildings in cities and in suburban areas. Here's how it works. Biodome LLC will pay for and build biodomes on top of apartment buildings. Building owners will pay us a flat rate per tenant per month. We will harvest the produce on a weekly basis, email the tenants what fruits and veggies are available for them, and leave their individualized bags of produce at the front desk for them to pick up. Building owners get to provide their tenants with a unique amenity, incentivizing people to want to live there, and it allows them to raise rent. If a building owner pays us $50 per tenant per month, but gets to raise rent by $100 per month, that $50 difference counts as eight to 12 times cash flow for the apartment owner. This is a win-win-win. Since tenants get healthy food right at their doorsteps, building owners monetize dead space, and we get a built-in customer base. As a social entrepreneur, one of the statistics that caught my eye was that around 
of people in low-income areas of cities do their weekly grocery shopping at a corner store similar to a 7-Eleven. This is part of a phenomenon referred to as a food desert, where there's a lack of access to fresh, healthy foods. Since biodomes would be growing produce in cities anyway, it only seemed right that we give access to healthy food to low-income areas, since malnutrition and diabetes are both associated with food deserts due to the amount of processed food people have to eat in these areas. For these reasons, all of the produce that is not sold on a weekly basis will be donated to local soup kitchens and corner stores in these low income areas in order uh, to help eliminate food deserts. We're also looking to receive B Corporation status in the near future to fit with our missions and values. We do face some competition in the indoor farming industry, but by working as a service-based business for apartment buildings, we create ourselves a niche market with little to no competition. Other things building owners may want to put on top of their buildings include HVACs, cell towers, or solar panels, but as an amenity, we generate much more value to the building owners. The agriculture industry is a $133 billion industry, with the largest margin of growth being in the productivity sector. Additionally, the indoor farming industry is a $52 billion industry that is one of the fastest growing industries in the United States with 1,200 acres of rooftop access available in New York City alone, we will have plenty of space to grow fresh produce in any city. Our manufacturer has estimated that each unit should cost us around $15,000 to build, but should produce upwards of $75,000 worth of produce annually. With low monthly expenses due to solar power and rainwater collection, we are projected to reach profitability within our first three years of sales, which we will use to continue to expand our business with a goal to have 15 units in the greater Philadelphia area by 2024. It won't be long before people are lining up to live in biodome apartments across the country. Why would you go to the grocery store to get produce that's been flown across the country when you can go downstairs for produce that was grown right on top of your building? Biodome is bringing the freshest, sustainably grown produce right to your door, bringing a healthy lifestyle everywhere we go. Help us bring Biodome to cities across the country. Thank you. Terrific. Uh, Thanks, Jar. Appreciate it. Um, Andrea, let's uh, switch over. Oh, that's Steve Andrea, not Andrea Andrea. Um, Andrea, let's let's switch over if we can to Q and A. Um, so judges, uh, let, let's. I don't know what the best way to work this is. So let's see if it gets chaotic or not. Um, but if anybody has a question, why don't you throw it out? I have a question. Um, great presentation. What a fantastic idea, Jara. Um, you're very enthusiastic. You've clearly made some uh, some difficult choices here. Was there a time when you wanted to give up on this, when you felt like this wasn't going to happen? And, and if so, can you tell us about it and how you got through that? Yeah, most definitely. I, I think that there have actually been a couple of times that I've, I've wanted to give up. I, I mean, my transition um, where, where I found out in the very beginning, where I found out that my, my sustainable skyscraper idea was gonna be way too expensive. And I was like, where am I gonna get this money? Um, that was that was a problem. And then moving into the residential market when I did 300 plus customer discovery interviews and found out that, you know, people didn't want to pay that amount of money to have uh, sustainably grown produce right in their backyard or, or on their deck or wherever um, that that was pretty crushing. But um, I think I think the, the worst part, the, the time when I was closest to feeling like I wanted to give up was um, right when everything started to take off after my prototype and everything. And I went to a bunch of pitch competitions and I actually lost two major pitch competitions on the exact same day. And I found out the results within 15 minutes of one another. And that was, that was kind of the moment where I was like, I don't know where I'm going to get money for this. I don't know what I'm going to do, but that's when, uh, you know, cryptocurrency came in to save the day. So <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. I have a question. Oh. <laughs> um, I have. Have you sold any units? Um, no, we have not sold any units, but we do have a, a 
commitment to put up a, uh, a unit um, in Mount Laurel, which we are working on, on finalizing all of the, uh, the details around. Um, and so we actually, we're a produce sales company. So we don't, we don't actually sell our units. We, we build, own, and maintain the units, but we sell produce and we make our, our money because of the, we make a, a sizable profit from it uh, because of the fact that our expenses are relatively low in terms of the actual agricultural production process because we use these sustainable methods like solar energy, we collect our own rainwater with the units, um, and then aeroponics reduce the, uh, the amount of water consumption drastically and grow plants quicker. How did you model your proof of concept? Like putting this on the top of a building for a year and really understanding what it might actually produce or not? So uh, in terms of modeling our proof of concept, um, so we've done a couple different models for our proof of concept. I would say that our first model for proof of concept was me actually building that first iteration, that prototype um, in my parents' backyard. Um, so that was proving that I could actually put together a system that would work and run itself uh, sustainably and collect its own energy and rainwater. Um, then moving forward, um, the validation that I received from different building owners was one of the ways that we closed in on what our target market would be and how we could utilize space within cities in order to monetize our, our product with selling produce. Um, and so we have changed our business model a couple of times and we finally concluded with uh, partnering with apartment buildings because of the fact that it ends up being that win-win-win situation between us, the, ten uh, the tenants of the building and the building owners. Um, and so because I've seen uh, what our prototype was able to grow in terms of uh, numbers of, of produce, um, that's where we were able to take and forecast our projections out for how many plants um, we could we can grow in our our next model? Um, we've we've been working on engineering for this. I work with an outside firm. I have three student engineers, and we have been working our asses off um, in order to uh, make sure that that we have everything down to the last detail about how it will work with the top of the building and how it will grow produce uh, as efficiently as possible. Sarah, this is just terrific. I'm so in awe of you and your tenacity and love that you're doing this. As, as a fellow social entrepreneur, I was really curious if you could tell us a bit more about how you see um, Biodome addressing the food desert issue in terms of if your clients are going to be potentially high income buildings predominantly, how you see the food then getting transported to the places that need it the most. Sure. So um, I've, I personally have done a lot of research into uh, companies like Tesla or Amazon in terms of how they started their infrastructure um, and were able to expand and bring the prices of, of various different things down. Um, so one of the things that we're looking to emulate in some ways is the same way that Elon Musk was able to make uh, electric cars cool and then bring the price down. We're sort of looking to do the same thing with bringing in biodome as a, as a status thing where you can get this fresh, healthy produce and then bring it in uh, for, for additional um, customers. We have done research on uh, LIHTC housing. Um, we have talked to LIHTC building owners um, and we've also looked into the Housing and Urban Development Act which has recently been given um, a, a lot more funding through the, the Biden administration. And so these are other ways that we could work with uh, LIHTC developers in order to incorporate biodomes sort of as, as co-op spaces for these lower income areas 
Um, so these are potential next steps that we can get into. However, we've identified what our, our uh, entry point to the market is, and we, we would really like to uh, get in through, through high-end apartment buildings. Hi, um, as an entrepreneur, can you share um, about previous ventures that you manage or founded? Sure. So uh, I've had a, a couple of um, learning experiences, we'll call them, um, as, a, as opposed to failed ventures. But um, I, my freshman year of college, uh, my roommate and I uh, decided to make a, uh, a, a modular contraption that went on the side of a college bed post that would both charge your uh, devices, would be a place where you could hold your phone, and then potentially a place where you could put your, your drink, um, like a, a coffee or, or a beer potentially, um, as we were college students and that was something we were interested in. Um, and so um, we went through the development process, we went through 3D printing, we looked into, um, uh, patents, we looked into licensing as well. Um, but I ended up having issues uh, between myself and the partner in terms of where we wanted to go with the business and how we wanted to operate. And so it ended up falling apart. Unfortunately, um, I attempted to work on a licensing deal for it myself. Um, I, I reached out to a couple of different firms. Um, but I was not able to, to come to an agreement for anything. So that was one of the ones that, that um, didn't work out. Um, additionally, I've been involved with uh, an app called SafeQuest, which was a, um, a, a mobile security app to try and help uh, students on campuses, on college campuses um, with the issue of getting into a ride share uh, or something like that. So your friends and family would potentially be notified about uh, whether you're going out and um, uh, that you get home safely. Um, so I, I definitely learned a lot through working with that company as well, um, but they, they did not continue moving, so. Oh, thank you. I had a question regarding the revenue model. You had mentioned uh, charging $50 per tenant. Is that with the business owners you've talked to, is that kind of the amount you've settled on? Um, so we haven't settled on an exact amount, um, but that that seems to be around the range of what, what uh, apartment owners have been interested in. So um, one of the, the quotes that I got from an apartment owner was they thought up. that their tenants would be willing to pay around $200 a month additional uh, for their, uh, for, for getting Sarah, essentially we, free grocery. Time is up. Sorry. Sorry, your time's up, dude. Sorry uh, about that. No, no worries. <laughs> Us too. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Terrific. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay, so your 10 minutes will begin now. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Today, please do me the honor of introducing to you all the Flourish by Sage hair care brand. I am Sienna Grant Mitzak, and I am the founder and creator of Flourish by Sage. I'm also a visual arts major and entrepreneurship minor at Montclair State University. Now, as a multiracial woman, I've always experienced a lot of difficulties in tending to my natural hair, being that my dad has very straight hair. My mom has very kinky hair. She has locks. I've always fallen right in the middle of that spectrum, which, as you can imagine, has called for a lot of confusion and really understanding my hair. Um, fortunately enough, I've really been able to go through this process and grow from it, and I want to inspire other people to do the same. A phrase that I live by is to always be a student of the world. And in me, honing in on this phrase throughout my life has really been a blessing for me. Um, it's been very important for me to excel within my schooling and academics. And Montclair State has really blessed me um, because of this commitment. So 
opportunities like this have presented itself to me because of this commitment. Um, and also previous um, opportunities in the past, such as the Montclair pitch competition, as well as the opportunity to be part of an Amazon Prime and Apple TV show called The College Tour in which Flourish by Sage was publicized. And from this foundation and this mindset to always be a student of the world, paired with that passion that I had to really spread self-love onto people um, and help them through this journey, I created Flourish by Sage. And Flourish by Sage is a textured hair care line that is meant to really empower people and enlighten them to embrace their hair through clean and sustainable hair care that is specific to hair type and hair goals. And for those of you that may not know, textured hair is a category that includes wavy, curly, and kinky hair types. On a daily basis, and as I realized that this was my passion, I talk to people every day and I figure out like how they feel on their journey. And I realized that a lot of people were in a similar place to what I was in. Um, they're very confused about how to tend to their natural hair. They don't know how to. And a lot of them gravitate to the wigs or the flat ironing. And it's really been a goal of mine to seek these people out and give them help. So with that, I conducted a survey of 60 people to really establish some type of data and basis behind this and establish that 94% of those people were simply unhappy with the current options out there and ultimately felt excluded from the hair care industry as a whole. What was it lacking? Many of them felt that it was lacking the aspect of convenience. They would go into these beauty supply stores and drug stores and they would spend countless time trying to figure out the product for them. And then by the time they would get that product, they would go through 20 others throughout the course of a year trying to figure out what would work for them and still be unsuccessful. They also felt that it was lacking a level of sustainability, being that a lot of these products were loaded with chemicals that really prevented them from being able to flourish within their natural hair journey. And that is why Flourish by Sage was created. It was created to really combat all these issues and provide that level of convenience and sustainability. So here you have the Lovely Kinks Hair Souffle, the Curl Power Hair Souffle, and the So Wavy Hair Souffle as the initial product line for Flourish by Sage. And if you go onto the website, you'll be able to take a free hair care consultation or hair quiz that'll automate um, a response for you for which product will work to you based off of you determining what your hair goals are, what your hair type is, and giving you an understanding for your hair type. And of course, these are the goals and morals around sustainability and cleanliness as a brand. The market size for textured hair is actually a pretty large market size, being that five and eight people have textured hair in the United States today. And it's really shocking to me that as I talk to these people on a daily basis, and I realize a lot of these people that are part of this demographic completely feel excluded and lost um, in tending to their natural hair and really embracing it and having that self-love within. And that is exactly who the target market is. People who are going on this journey to embrace their hair's natural state. And as you see on the right, these are a few people from the previous photo shoots that Flourish by Sage has done, a few of my friends and such. And then you also see a woman here who is just starting her journey at the top left. And she's a part of this. It's really about giving people the tools and resources and especially the confidence to go on their journey. So she's a huge part of this. How does Flourish by Sage compare to its competitors? As I mentioned before, Flourish by Sage is really adamant in its drive to be a sustainable and clean brand, but it's also very important to me that I label these products based off of hair type and hair goals to eliminate that whole sense of, of not knowing and the unknown and establish convenience. And in order for people to really get empowered about how to tend to their natural hair, they really need to have education be given to them. And that is why if you go onto the website, you're going to see tons of educational content um, where people have hair care hit, hacks and tips. And that way people will be able to develop an understanding for their hair type and how to tend to it. There's also tons of educational content on the social media platforms, primarily Instagram. As far as marketing opportunities this far, I've already mentioned the previous ones that I've done and had the opportunity to be a part of through Montclair State, so blessings to them. Um, but I've also been able to be part of the Sunrise Radio Show. And within that opportunity, I was able to 
talk to teenage students about my journey as a 19 year old entrepreneur who was a full time student and still is a full time entrepreneur and also juggling work on top of that. So that was an amazing opportunity and a great opportunity for me to really just pour into younger people that are, are basically coming up into my age group and inspire them in some way. As far as other marketing opportunities, of course, brand ambassadors and commercials, just to get the reach that Flourish by Sage needs to really give people that education needed. And where is Flourish by Sage today? Flourish by Sage has generated $2,334.98 in revenue. And while it costs approximately $5 to make each product that includes materials, packaging, and ingredients, each product is sold for $15.99. Now, as you see here, an average price for a similar product is approximately $19, meaning that as I'm able to experiment with these products or with the price point, I'm going to be able to find the most successful price point um, in that way. And also, the $5 to make each product is going to significantly decrease as wholesale sizes increase. As far as ongoing costs, the website, shipping labels, and widgets for the website um, which is for the website include the hair care quiz that I previously mentioned, as well as testimonials. So people are really able to establish a sense of trust within the business. What does the three-year plan look like for Flourish by Sage? Right now, I have like the take off stage right here in the beginning. And it's really been about establishing myself on social media and getting the reach out in that way, because this is my first time doing this, you know, and there's no blueprint for it. So that's been amazing. It's also been a huge blessing of mine to be part of or be stocked in a salon and a beauty supply store. So through these opportunities, I've been able to really find myself as an entrepreneur and it's been amazing to it's been amazing to see them believe in my vision. So I won't lie though, that's definitely been a challenge for the brand being that I did create this brand out of COVID. Many of these beauty supply stores and salons are really suffering from exposure and the amount of traction that they're getting nowadays. So even though they placed these orders and they were able to have these products stocked in stores, they haven't been able to put in any additional order just due to the state of everything right now. So that's why it's so important to really establish myself on e-commerce because that is the direction we're going in, but I'm still going to be working um, and getting these products in on a local level and ultimately on a very grand retail level. As far as action plan for 2022, I've had the same line of the three products for about a year now. So it's been um, definitely good to hear everybody's feedback about what they want from the line. And going forward, I definitely want to act on that. So I'm going to work with the chemist to expand the product line. I also want to hire a media production specialist to really get the reach. And as I'm hitting these different milestones within the business, it's very important to continue to expand the product line and innovate, as well as working with the packager to operate on the business and have a space for it. As far as 2024, I want to really expand the product line further and have a larger marketing budget to get that exposure that it needs. And I want to leave you all with the ingredients list for the Lovely Kinks Hair Souffle. Um, it's been an honor to speak to you all today. And thank you so much for this opportunity. You guys were all born to flourish. All right, mm -hmm. terrific. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, Sienna. Um, so now we're gonna do the judges Q and A. So judges, you know, when you're ready to ask a question, unmute yourself, Andrea, if you wouldn't mind starting another 10 minute clock, that would be phenomenal. So I'll, I'll start, uh, great job, Sienna. That was, that was really excellent. Um, just when it comes to the vision of the business, mm -hmm. um, if I understand this correctly, you're like a, are you a zero waste or you're an environmentally friendly textured product? Is that correct? Yes. So how do you stand out from all of the other environmentally friendly textured products? Well, for me, this brand is really based around instilling within people the sense of education and it's a passion project. So regardless of, you know, all these different aspects and the ways that people market it, I plan to really market it through education. So the way that we market this is really going to be how the brand shines through. Um, but I definitely do want to move towards zero waste. At this time, these ingredients are naturally sourced. And that's amazing because as you see, like with supply chains and things like that, and people buying from these foreign places, it's really been a problem for them. So 
I would love to keep this on like a local level where I can source all of my things and ingredients and materials locally. And um, just going forward, I definitely want to bring that component into it too. This is a clean and sustainable brand that is going to help your hair flourish. But it's more so just about establishing a sense of family within the brand so that people want to be a part of this family and they want to get educated from this family and be taken by the hand and have me help them along this journey. How did, had a, oh, how did you arrive at the compositions and what testing did you do for the- at The composition as, as in like generating this product? Yes. So I love talking about this. Honestly, overnight, I became like a chemist. I started like with COVID and everything. I, I'll be honest, when I went to college, my main thing was to go there, um, learn visual design and these things, and then go off and become like a creative director at one point in my life. But with COVID and everything happening, I was like, the time is now. Um, so I decided to just hone in and go after my passion, started doing extensive research for weeks and weeks on end, going through constant trial and error, and really just trying to research to find exactly what is going to work to create a line that is going to give people what they want. And it's been amazing so far. Um, I've been able to generate something that people love and I get amazing feedback. But going forward, as I mentioned in the slideshow, I definitely wanna work with the chemists going forward as I expand the brand and the product lines. I have a question. <laughs> First of all, the great presentation, and unfortunately, I cannot use your products. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> uh, as a follow up to Harris' question, yeah. is there any scientific verification to the comp composition or the formula that you have created? You, you specified you're going to speak with chemistry, but is it safe to use it as, a, as of today? Yes. Yeah, so when I generated this and as I did my research, a lot of it actually came from chemists online. So I began to like watch their YouTube channels and I began to get into like a chemist hub where I would learn like different phases. So there's a whole thing to it. There's a there's a cool down phase, a water phase, um, an oil phase and things as such that things have to be at certain temperatures. Um, there's certain percentages of certain things that I've been able to really get access to like their platform as chemist and learn from them. Um, you can go on and like ask them different questions. <coughs> And that was definitely very helpful for me generating this because I'm no like official chemist, but I've been able to learn from the inside of them and how they generate their products. Okay, thank you. Of course. I was wondering in say three years, where do you see your channel mix versus marketplace sales, direct web versus retailers? Okay, so as a brand for Flourish by Sage, I think it's very important, of course, to have it be an e-commerce thing as well, because that is the day and age that we live in, right? Um, but I also want to really be expanding out into retail stores such as Whole Foods, Target, Sephora, and things as such. So that was something that I kind of mentioned in the three-year plan. It was 10 minutes, so I figured I'd talk about it when someone would ask me. Um, so thank you for that. But um, yeah, so that's what I want to do. Going forward, I definitely want to expand on a local level to really get Flourish by Sage in um, locally. But as things, as I escalate things and gain that exposure online and really establish that sense of trust, I want this to be a brand where people go into these retail stores and they're like, Flourish by Sage, oh my gosh, they have this, like, I got to get my hands on this, you know, and people know what it is. They don't just go into a salon and that's probably on the level I'm at now where they'll go into these salons and they might not know what I am. So they overlook me, the one customer or whatever they get every hour and go for the other brand that they know. So it was really about instilling that trust within um, the market and within people, giving them that education, getting out into these retail stores like Whole Foods, Mar um, Target and Sephora and things as such um, as of like the three year plan and also making sure that this is established on e-commerce as well. So basically, if I was able to get into those different channels, things would be sold wholesale. So what is one of the challenges you, you've experienced as an entrepreneur? A huge challenge, like I was mentioning previously in the, in the slide, was um, really just me um, trying to gain that exposure that I need as a brand and in the midst of COVID and all these things, that's definitely been a challenge. But more than that, um, another challenge that I've definitely faced is really just like 
of course, starting this brand, being somebody so young um, and leveraging all of my money, like putting it together, $1,500 I invested in this and immediately just going so hard on this in school and then just creating it and just being something that now I look at as my baby. So that's definitely been a challenge for me as well. And another thing is when I did my first vendor event, that's also a story I always love to talk about. That was an amazing um, opportunity for me. I did it in New York, right on the water by um, Williamsburg, if you guys are familiar with that. And they have hundreds of people come in, in and out. And within the first hour, this was my first vendor. Not one person walked past my vendor. Well, came up to my vendor, I should say. They all walked past. <laughs> but, um, oh my gosh, this makes me emotional. Um, so after that hour of people passing me by, I realized that, give me a second. Got this. Take a deep breath. I'm sorry, guys. No, you're good. After that hour of people passing me by, I began to realize that this is bigger than me. And I just began sorting people, um, see seeking people out and telling them about, you know, the brand and what it stands for and really just educating them about it. And within that day, I got more customers than I ever did. Um, and one day I was able to get 32 customers within a few hours. And that was like a huge accomplishment for me within the brand. I'm so sorry, guys. Like, but yes, that was definitely like a huge accomplishment of mine for me. Um, just doing that first vendor and really just getting that confidence for me going forward to always seek people out. So I go into literally grocery stores and I seek people out. I have flyers, I have my business cards and I'm constantly seeking people out to tell them about the brand. And that was like, for me, like the switch in my mind that was like, I got this. And no matter what happens, like whether I win or lose today, this is going to be something that is a passion project. It is a passion project and I'm going to prevail. Absolutely. Thank you, Sienna. I know it's hard. It's like your heart and soul is in this. It's your baby. So I know we're, <laughs> it's tough, but my first question was, where can I buy some? Um, Cause I would love some product. Um, <laughs> second question was, are you manufacturing this in-house right now? Just you and long-term what's your plan for scale and manufacturing? Um, so you would be able to buy at e-commerce on the website, um, flourishbysage.com. You would also be able to purchase it, like I said, in that beauty supply store in um, East Orange, New Jersey. It's called Sisterhood Beauty Supply, as well as the Jersey City Salon. Um, it's called Enjoyable Hair Studio. Yeah. Which I had tissues by. Um, and you would also be able to, sorry, your second question, am I ma manufacturing it? That is manufactured through my home right now. And that is why by 2023, as of next year, I definitely wanna be moving out of that bootstrapping process and have a space where I can manage the business. Got it, amazing, thank you. I know it's also tough. It's a panel of people who don't all have textured hair. So <laughs> more power to you for owning the brand. You're doing a great job. Thank you, I appreciate hey, a lot it. Of, a lot of them don't have any hair. To be fair. <laughs> To be fair, true. No hair opportunity, one way or another. Future science. What? <laughs> Future product had to Hair's grow hair. <laughs> yeah. um, do we have Is other yeah. questions for we're Sienna? At, we're at four seconds here, so we're, oh. here we go. That's the end. <laughs> Thank you guys so Perfect much. Amazing Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Judges, okay. I will set the timer for 10 minutes. And you can either stay here, Sienna, or go back to the uh, student's room. That's up to you. Sienna, you're muted. I said thank you. I'm going to go to the bathroom. <laughs> thank you, though. I, I just, yep. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, there you go. Hey, judges, you have six minutes. And we should have... Kosh, are you here? Uh, he's coming. I may have to go join that room and bring him in. I'll be right back. Oh, wait. No, don't. You don't need to bring him in yet. 
but you can. Hi there, everyone. Let's see. Well, I think we've got to wait a sec. No yeah. worries. Hi, Hi Kosh. You're in a little bit early, so you have uh, uh, six minutes. The judges are, are still filling out paperwork, so mm -hmm. uh, you can relax, turn your screen off if you want, and uh, mm -hmm. we'll, uh, we'll let you know when it's time to set up. Okay. All right. Gotcha. Thank you. You are welcome. And that was my bad. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, judges, one thing I we mentioned, if any of you want to contact or want to be a resource, you can feel free to put that in the feedback form, your name and contact if, you, if you'd like to, for any of the, any of the presenters. Excuse me. Coffee. Hey guys, can everybody turn their uh their uh, microphones off while the judges are doing their thing, uh, unless you want to say something. Thank you. Two minute warning for the judges. One minute warning for the judges.
Judges, the time is up. Okay, thank you, judges. We will get another two minutes of rest and then uh, Akash will throw you on the clock at that point. So if you wanna turn on your screen either now or in two minutes, then you'll have two minutes to uh, get ready and we'll be off to the races. Hey, Kosh, if you want to just go ahead and turn your video on and I'll get you set up for a spotlight. Gotcha. Oh, sorry, I was away from the screen for a sec. All good. Uh, Try that again. Excuse me, let me see what I'm doing. Oh, this up here for a sec. I don't know if you have a presentation, if you want to share your screen and get that set up as well. Yep, yep. You can go ahead and do that. Just make sure it's all working properly. Let's see. Everyone can see my screen, right? Uh, yes. All right, good. Let's go ahead. Right. We're not starting you yet. Mm -hmm. we'll you know. Okay, um, judges, you all uh, good to go. You got your energy back. You uh, used your two minutes wisely, I hope. Um, Akash, are you good to go? You need a minute? I am all set to go. All right, then I would uh, I would say let's get started. Right, gotcha. Andrew, can you start the 10 minute timer, please? Yep, timer starting. Thank you. Hi, well, hello everyone. My name is Akash. I'm the CEO and co-founder of SmartMS3, and our team is here to bring adherence to physical rehab. So before I talk more about the business, let me tell you a bit about myself. My name is Akash, co-founder of this business, and I'm currently a junior at Rutgers studying cell bio and neuroscience along with entrepreneurship. But before I got to this stage, a lot has happened in the past in my life that actually drove a lot of what I am, who I became today. So when I was born, I was born in Amritsar, India, and moved to the USA when I was around three years old. And it was a drastic change in my own life. I faced um, barriers of culture. I didn't know how to speak the language and just did not know how to really mingle with other folks in my age group. Even when I was five to 10, I had no idea what was going on. So those first beginning years of my life, they drove a lot of certain principles I live by today. And if I had to describe those principles within five words, it would be this. I like to go big or go home. And a lot of what I do, it's bold thinking of the future driven through the scientific medium. I like to use technology to pave a way to really create that dent into the universe that can help others out, help folks out and just create a better universe or better world for other folks tomorrow. And I have been doing that throughout my life. In fact, in high school, I've been a part of several internship programs that allowed me to really pursue my endeavors and research, come up with their various ideas, publish, and then get them out there and do several conference presentations. And in this example, I had the opportunity to look into cirrhosis. I did my research there and came up with a novel way to actually diagnose the um, disease, which really helped me think I can change the world and make an impact out there. But this wasn't the biggest challenge I had to overcome. My most recent one was having to see my grandmother su suffer a stroke attack. This left half of her body in a partial paralysis position where she couldn't walk, she couldn't talk as well. And her overall quality of life really diminished literally overnight. And having to see her struggle like that, it wasn't something I could bear. I knew I could do something. I had proven it to myself before. And I really wanted to build something that can help her go through something that can help her out. And the key thing that she needed was to do physical therapy. She didn't want to do it. And she's not alone when it comes to that. So when I broke down the physical therapy process, 
I saw that everyone follows this typical process. They get an injury, they do some therapy. And the key thing that scared me the most was 70% of folks, they didn't do more than five sessions. They came in, one for five, and then left. It's pretty surprising, 70%. And this issue, it's not like it's, you know, just getting smaller or anything. It's actually growing over the past couple of years. Right now, 110 million Americans, which is one third of America around, are leaving physical therapy early. And it's not helping them out. They don't go to PT, they don't recover. And clinics, on the other hand, it's not like they're benefiting from this any way, shape, or form. They're losing their clients, they're losing patients, and it's like $4.7 billion going down the drain for them. It's a lose-lose situation for everyone involved here. And our team has actually talked to hundreds of PTs and hundreds of patients to really understand why that's the case. Patients on one hand are saying, it's been two weeks, I'm still doing my therapy, but I don't know if I'm getting better. And PTs on the other hand, they're saying, you know, we have 70% of our patients, they seem like they're engaged. And after a couple of visits, they never come back. And it makes sense if you think about it now. Imagine going to a physical therapy clinic, exercising, and the only metric to tell you you're getting better is your own subjective data. With them asking, how do you feel? Rate your pain one to 10. It doesn't make sense. So that's where our team wants to step in. We're here to create a biofeedback tool that actually tells you how you're doing by looking at your muscles themselves that tell you how patients are getting better. Here's a short demo. And I'm pretty sure you guys are curious why do I have this briefcase back here? The reason why folks want to use our technology over other ones, the current EMG device out there, they're this big. It's annoying, it's hassle, it's, you know, you don't want wires sticking out of that stuck to. Instead, we created a much smaller consumer-friendly device that's literally handheld, attaches to any muscle group and tells you how you get better. And this device can actually connect to one of our, excuse me, it connects to one of our apps, which allows you to actually view data and tell you how you're doing. The key thing the app provide, it's real-time reassurance. Patients now really understand how they're getting better and if they're even doing exercises correctly. Take, it keeps patients connected with their physical therapist inside and outside the clinic. And above all else, we're going to track their progress, whether it's weekly, monthly, yearly. We're going to be there for them, and we're going to be able to recommend exercises based off how they're doing. So with a device done with their app built, our next option to go forward was actually test this out in clinics. What we did was we went to three clinics over a three-month period and worked with around 40 patients. And the two data points I really want you guys to look into is the patient engagement rate, which was around 15%, and patient retention rate, which was around 30% at these clinics. Our team launched in there for three months through COVID and did some exponential increase in both places. Patient engagement, we 5 x that to 75% understanding how therapy works and actually being engaged in the process, and 30% to 100% in patient retention rate. It's enormous and it's super beneficial for me personally to see how people are actually recovering now and getting better rather than jumping from clinic to clinic, hoping for results in that way. So when we look at the market opportunity, it's there. Right now, we've signed up 300 clinics. We're going to continue forward to the orthopedic route and sign up the rest of the remain, right? Say, that has a $17 billion market cap. And even going beyond that in the US, all physical therapy clinics, such as neurology, pediatrics, geriatrics, it's a $40 billion market cap there. And our go-to market strategy is just as simple. We're partnering up with some health and wellness centers. We've signed up Ivy Rehab, which got us our 300 initial clinics. We're going to Sphere, VA Health Office, phys professional PT, and ATI physical therapy. Through that, we know that the demand for our product is there. Our job is just not to supply it for them. At our competitive landscape, it's a general process where we pride ourselves on providing that live biometric feedback and real-time muscle fatigue indicators, while including connecting people to physical therapists, providing certain reports, and most of all, being user-friendly for them. And the business model we're using here, it's a B2B strategy. Clinics are gonna be paying us. First, they'll pay us for device, which can be between one to four devices, depending on the size of clinics. And on top of that, they'll be doing a monthly SaaS fee, where each clinic will be paying around $20 per patient using the device. And the reason we know the strategy is gonna work is because we're building our device to be a reimbursable tool for patients. Right now, the top five insurance groups already have approved of this, and our job's kind of fitting into their already written rules. The one I want to highlight here is especially Medicare. They're allowing $40 to $50 to be reimbursed per session. So imagine a guy comes in, we give them our device. A clinic can pay off that device within with one patient that might go to the clinic literally four to five times, and their device gets paid off. It's incredible for them. It's especially helpful for us, knowing that patients get the full benefit and clinics don't have to reap any you know, monetary value out of it. 
Above this, Medicare even introduced a new version where remote therapeutic monitoring allows clinics to allow patients to take the device home, use it in that setting as well, and then get reimbursed for that as well, which is just awesome for all sides, I'd say. And to break down basic unit economics here, the device costs can be around 70 bucks. Monthly patients that we see per clinic is around 150 different patients. And the monthly revenue we're generating or expected to generate as we continue is going to be around $3,000 per clinic right now. And I'd love to break down the financial projections all, but I've had 10 minutes. So the three things that I want to really highlight to you guys is we're expect expected to become a little less than a 200,000 visits by the end of this year. We're expected to generate $1 million revenue next year and become a five to $6 million business in three years. And we're raising right now. So anyone that doesn't want to invest, I'm happy to chat and take calls from there. Now, of course, we could not have done this without an amazing team with us. Our team is driven by the key values of being gritty, curious, and having a thirst of learning from us and folks around us. We're an interdisciplinary team coming from backgrounds of neuroscience, media, electrical engineering, finance, and even software engineering. Anything that we don't know that we can't teach ourselves, we're always looking for folks around us to kind of drive and you know really fuel our entrepreneurial spirit to learn from other folks. And if we can't, we like to learn from each other as well and just grow together as a community as we're building here. And we're all students at the end of the day. This was literally my schedule this week. It's chaotic, but one thing I really love about it, it drives that entrepreneurial spirit and drives us to kind of go forward. There's no pause, there's no break. Instead, it just drives us to kind of keep building upon each other. And all our work, it's getting us progress in the news. People are noticing us and we know that they're really creating a benefit out there for other folks. And we couldn't have done this without an amazing advisory board. Folks here range from the head of hardware from Hinge Health, which is a $6 billion business right now, all the way to a director of clinical outcomes at Ivy Rehab, who have supported us and taught us as we continue growing. And it continues to thrive our thirst of knowledge right now. And at the end of it, I just wanna share a quick clip of my grandma. It, I always use this device on her first, and it loves, I love to see how it ends up on her. So one quick clip of how I get happy with her. One, two, three, kick. Very good. One, two. And yeah, that was one of the best things I've done. So thank you everyone for listening. Uh, please join us as we continue to revolutionize physical therapy. And I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Perfect timing. Yeah, really. Great. Thank, thank you so much, Akash. Um, mm -hmm. We'll now open it up for questions. If we could put 10 minutes on the clock. Judges, you have the floor. 10 minutes starts. Hello. Yes. Yeah, so my first question, actually, we'll ask only one question. Um, I have many. Mm -hmm. how many. How much money have you raised so far? And what was the valuation? Yeah, so right now, up to date, before we actually opened our round, we were raising money through pitch competitions, grants, all this stuff. Through that, we raised around $30,000. Now we officially opened up our newer round that's at 500K. We're raising at 500K at a $5 million pre-money valuation through a safe note. So for that, we have around 300K commitments right now. And we're trying to close that round within the next couple of months. And you were able to develop a SaaS application and other device based on with 50K mm -hmm. only? Yeah so, mm -hmm. yeah, so with the 30K, that allowed us to develop early, early prototypes get something different out there that the market hasn't built yet. And that's what the 30K allowed us to do, some basic testing. 500K is more for expanding it out there, getting some other regulation kind of passed by it as well. Okay, thank you. It's mm -hmm. really inspiring to, uh, to see something like this happen very quickly and be very effective and obviously quickly profitable. Why are you not charging more for this? On what side? The um, device or the, re I mean, the... The device in terms of selling it for seventy dollars, and mm -hmm. you know, for four visits, they've paid it, and they're making three thousand dollars a month on it. Just curious mm -hmm. about how you chose the price point. Yeah, so right now we're initially starting with a low price point because we saw that as a strategy to really get ourselves in the clinic in the first place. A lot of these devices out there are, first of all, a lot bigger, a lot more technical, you can say, because some of them look like IV stands, and they cost upwards to a couple of thousand dollars. And I highly doubt it if I go into a clinic, I say, hi, I'm a college student. I have this enormous device. Can you guys try it out? It just did not seem like a good sales pitch that I could pass off on versus a good sales pitch that they'd want to take in the first place. So we decided keep it low. 
we can even sell the device for free. What our business model relies on is that reimbursement aspect because so many people can buy these devices. I mean, you can buy these devices off the internet, but the data analytics we do behind the works, that's what we're really charging behind. And we can, you know, slowly charge it up from like 20, 25. It can go up to $30. Reimbursement is going to kind of back us up on that, I'd say. So we're starting low and we're going to kind of build our way forward as we, you know, generate traction, get more folks on board and just buy into the whole idea. Fantastic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Definitely recommend never starting a pitch with, hi, I'm a college student. Um, <laughs> I'm sure that hasn't worked so well for you, but um, you're phenomenal. So nobody would know anyways, which is mm. the, the trick of it. Um, I was curious about in terms of maintenance, if the device mm. breaks, what's your process for that? And um, what, mm. are the, what do the clinics do in that situation? Yeah. So the way we actually tested it, our testing process is first we manufacture, we have validation and verification testing that goes within it. So we kind of designed this in a way that the device itself, I like to model this after like the PS5 model. Folks that buy a PS5, they're not going to you know, buy the next version of a console next year. They're going to keep that for the next four or five years, right? And that's kind of what we're trying to targeting. We did the good manufacturing practices. We built our boards to last and we built all the device to last. In the case or in a scenario where the device drops, something happens like that, we chose to make the clinics very close and nearby us because we're a team of engineers. I will literally run to the clinic. I'll be like, tell me your problem. I'm here to solve it and get it running and get it back up again. So we, we make it built to last. If something does occur, we're at the clinics first thing tomorrow morning here there to fix it. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Do you have any regulatory pathways that you have to go through to be able to get you know reimbursement through um, Medicare and insurance? Yeah, so FDA is going to require us to become a medical device before we get reimbursement kicking in. And right now, we looked at two sides. So FDA allows you to go through a general wellness guideline. So that's basically, you don't need to be a medical device, but the claims that supporting it, it has to be something simple that we're just collecting data, we're providing input on how muscles work. We can't say that it's getting stronger, weaker, any of that guidelines. But right now, we're going through FDA as a class two medical device. And that allows Medicare to reimburse us and kind of go through that process as well. And of course, we don't know everything there yet. So a lot of our advisors are kind of guiding us through that, but definitely something we're looking forward to going through and kind of reason why we're raising money for that. Awesome. The, the slide where you showed you moved um, retention from 30 to 100% is awesome. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, what was the total population of that study? Like how yes. Many people did yeah, so we did it with 40 patients there, and that was 40 patients randomly selected. We chose how many there were and made sure to kind of work with them. It was around, it was across three clinics, and the study itself lasted around three months. So most of these folks, they were, you know, initially just starting therapy off. It was their maybe first, second visit when the device was attached to them. And we were able to keep them going until, like, I think some folks ended around 18 sessions. Some folks had 20 allowed sessions, but most of them, actually all of them finished off there. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, if nobody else has a question, I have another question about like legal liability and coverage. If there's someone mm -hmm. who's injured using your device, what's your legal strategy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the device aspect of injury so far, it's, you know, once again, through manufacturing practices that allow us to be covered there. So itself, the device, it's not going to be like electrocuting or shocking you. It's there as like, I'd say, yeah, if people get scared if they like see the device, they're saying, oh my God, I'm going to- The wires. The yeah, wires yeah. scares some folks. So we tell them initially that the device is more like a blood, blood monitoring cuff. It's there, it's going to be stuck to you. It's going to be kind of sucking data in, but not going to be pushing anything into you. So once again, we look at the manufacturing from the fundamental levels. We look at how that's kind of going in it. And through our verification validation testing, we literally, just literally stick the device onto ourselves, let it run for a couple of hours, if it's good for running a couple of hours and someone has to use it for 20, maybe 30 minutes, we know it's going to work then. Mm -hmm. Can I ask another question? Yes. Uh, so other than increasing engagement for clinics, uh, can you generate insights for clinics about patients or therapists in general? Yeah. So we can generate insights in the sense that what patient population, so if I was like a clinic, we're pretty much building a catalog of data for them at the end of the day. And they clinics and start saying that, suppose they have a patient, first comes in with a 70 year old, has some sort of shoulder injury, uh, frozen shoulder, and they can try some exercise onto them and see the best one that works. 
that data gets stored into our system that we can share with them. And then they can use the same data to say that, hey, it's a different 70 year old, but they have the same classifications as the earlier patients. So we already know what exercises to try first. If those don't work, then we can start making tweaks and that stuff onto them. So clinics and, you know, they have data proven evidence that these exercises work versus they don't work rather than, you know, once again, relying on the subjective measurements of, you know, patient A said they feel good versus patient B with the same exercise that they feel bad. Do you implement any AI in your solution? Right now we're not, I mean, it's minor at the most, but we're staying we're still in the process of just mainly collecting data. Our main goal is to make sure patients are reassured of the therapy. So as, as they're getting better, they're healthier, but AI and integrating AI ML algorithms definitely part of the plan later on. All right, thank you. Yep. For your revenue model, you said split between um, mm -hmm. the device and then software, right? So what yes. are your projections in the future? Where would more of the money come, come from? Would it be through software or through the device? Definitely through the software. The device, I mean, we were actually on the border of selling the device for free, I'd say, because we knew the main the main value proposition that patients are going to get is going to be through the software itself. The, the analogy I usually like to give is most devices like this out there, folks spit data out at patients. And then they say the patients have to come up to the conclusion by themselves, which is extremely difficult with this type of data. So what we're doing is we're taking the data, we're letting them see the raw data at first, and then we're generating conclusions based off what we built off after it. So looking at, you know, what's your muscle fatigue like, Patient can't tell that real time, nor are they going to be curious about that learning about that after therapy. It's something that has to be done right away while they're exercising so they know how they're getting better. And that's kind of what we're really driving upon. Reimbursement is going to kind of back that up on the reimbursement side and kind of why software is going to be our main, for, main way of making money versus the hardware device. Mm -hmm. I may have missed this because I, I had a little technical glitch in the beginning that kicked me out. But mm -hmm. when I was reading your presentation earlier, uh, I noticed there's someone on your board who works at one of the companies that you compared your product mm -hmm. to, right? Yes, yes. Hey, That's how I was. Yes, so I can tell you a bit more about that. So Sean Rahimi, so he was initially a founder himself and he built a device that was meant for physical therapy. And he was doing electro stimulation for pain relief. And he saw the same vision of kind of what I'm building to what he built. And he recently sold that company to Hinge Health, which is why he's the head of hardware there now. And the reason why I like comparing to Hinge Health is on the top, on the surface level, you see ourselves as, you know, a basic you know, device company that just sells devices and that's it. We're building towards a vision that allows telehealth to be more accessible for physical therapists. And you break physical therapy down to two pieces. There's Rehab that comes into muscle and then rehab and range of motion. The time is up. Oops. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, I couldn't answer that. I'm happy to connect offline and answer that more in depth. Um, thank you so much, Akash. We uh, we appreciate it, judges. We're going to start a six minute clock for you to uh, um, do your scoring and feedback for Akash. And Akash, you're welcome to stay here in the main room for the rest of the presentation. But if you want to go back and talk to the other competitors in the other room, you are also welcome to do that. Just like the gotcha. Okay. Sounds good. It was really great presenting to you guys. Thank you. Nice job. Thanks, Akash. Mm -hmm.
And Larry, I see we have a break scheduled next. Yes, we do. All right, cool. Judges, you have one minute remaining. Judges, the time is up. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. We're actually right on time. So I'm not going to mess around. Uh, we have a break until 2.50. So get your coffee, do whatever else you think is appropriate. And uh, thank you so much. We look forward to seeing everybody back at 2.50.
a minute and a half remaining and we'll be back on. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, I am letting Ari in. Uh, she has to. Too late. She's already in. Perfect. Okay. Ari, if you want to hide, Steve, you want to go ahead and um, share your screen. I'll stop sharing on my screen. And then you okay. can get yourself set up. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll start the clock. You know, you have two minutes to get set up and whatever. You got time. Also, hi, Ari. How are you? Hi, who? Ari, how are you? All right. Um... I can get started. Not yet. Uh, I we guess. <laughs> do we have? Uh, I just want to make sure we have all the judges back, Harry. So hang on one second. We have one, uh, two, three, four, five, six. Darlene, we're missing. Darlene, you there? Yeah, I'm here. All right, she's there. Cool. All right, terrific. Uh, Ari, whenever you are ready. Um, uh, let us know and Andrea will start the 10 minute clock for your presentation. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, begin. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Aria Zhao and I'm the owner of a small business called Baked by Aria. So before I get into the nitty gritty of my business, I wanted us all to take a little trip down memory lane. So if you've seen this cake, chances are um, growing up, either your mom or your grandma made a cake for your birthday. It was probably your grandma or your Aunt Sally's recipe that tasted absolutely amazing. But then when you got the pictures afterwards, you might have realized that it didn't quite look as good as it tasted. Um, but you just thought, well, it's the thought that counts. So I'm not going to think too much of it. But then on the other hand, um, maybe you were someone like me and my family where we didn't DIY too many things and we probably remembered birthdays at the last minute. This was probably your view the night before or the morning of your loved one's birthday, probably in your local shop, right, grocery store. And you're like, okay, we're just gonna pick out a cake from here. You hand it to whoever's the clerk at the baker section or the cashier and say, can you write happy birthday blank? And maybe sometimes it ended up looking like this. Not the best, but hey, again, it's the thought that counts. We got the cake. It's customized the best we could do. And that's that. So fast forward to today in 2022. Um, if you're someone really into social media, you like your cakes to look good for your Instagram feed and your Facebook posts, You've probably seen a cake like this. This is a popular um, celebration cake from the Milk Bar store, which is really trendy, especially among younger audiences. Um, this is their typical design, a naked cake, not too much going on, but their smallest size is $60 and it only comes in two flavors. So kind of a win-lose situation um, with cakes throughout the years. And then you have Baked by Airy by myself, where I specialize in bespoke buttercream cakes and sweet treats, as you can see in the picture here. I aspire to create cakes with the customer in mind. I'm not just creating something to sell it, but I want your cakes to look as good as you do on your special day. I want you to be able to look back on your pictures and remember how beautiful your cake was, but that it also tasted amazing. Um, in contrast to some cakes you might pick up at um, a grocery store where they've been sitting out there a couple days, they use box mix, not the freshest ingredients, and so on. Um, and so here's 
more of the things that I offer. Like I said, um, I create cakes with my customer in mind. There are no two cakes that are the same. Um, I aspire for your cake to reflect your theme, um, reflect your personality and just who you are as a person. Um, and just a little plug, you know, Valentine's Day is coming up in a few weeks. Um, the photo in the center on the bottom is one of my offerings for Valentine's Day, which is a cupcake bouquet. Because if you're someone like me, yes, you love getting flowers, but two days later, they're already half dead. You have to throw them away. Um, and it's like the holiday never happens. So why don't you get a cupcake bouquet where you can give flowers to your loved one and you can have something that tastes amazing. So to tell you a little bit about my baking journey, I grew up loving to bake. Um, my mom actually reminded me the other day that there was a time where I entered um, a baking uh, cupcake competition. I actually won and I have absolutely no recollection of that whatsoever, but I still was very involved. I baked um, at a lot of school fundraisers and bake sales. And one of um, the most special moments to me was in high school, I was the vice president of a women's empowerment club. And one of our main focuses um, was breast cancer awareness. So I actually baked cupcakes for a breast cancer awareness bake sale. And with the support of my school community, we were able to hand a $500 check to the St. Peter's Breast Cancer Center. Um, so in addition to that, I would bake for family events and um, little celebrations. And then as the pandemic started, um, social gatherings became more limited, less things for me to bake. Um, so I just decided to keep it going because I really needed a creative outlet. And you know, I feel like everyone had that one thing that helped them stay afloat while we were on lockdown. And for me, that was baking. So I would share them on social media. People love them and they're like, you know what, why don't you turn this into a business? Like I would pay real money for it. So I launched officially on August 25th in 2020 on an Instagram account and I made an announcement. I would start accepting orders September 1st. And as soon as September 1st came along, I was fully booked for that month. Now, um, like new entrepreneurs, I was a little bit hesitant about the term um, entrepreneur or business owner. So I would just say, oh, this is just my passion project. It's just what I do. Um, but my demand really grew. And that's when I decided like, you know, take some time to figure out how can I effectively run my business? So I relaunched in June of 2021, um, where I had more specific ordering process. I was more organized. Um, I had a more specific menu and what I offer. And that way I was able to serve people more effectively. And then today I've served over a hundred customers. Last year I had $5,000 in revenue and I recently just launched my brand new website. Um, so here are just some of the reviews that I've received. I love when people who aren't really cake people tell me that they love my cakes because that tells me it's not just people with sweet tooths that love what I do but people who aren't really fans of baked goods originally are also fans of how my taste cakes taste look and taste. So if I could describe myself, I would describe myself in one word as a multi-potentialite. And that's not a word people hear too often. So I decided to share a few multi-potentialites that you might be familiar with. Um, of course, we have one of my icons, Buddy Velastro, who is known as the cake boss, very popular here in New Jersey. Of course, we have Rihanna, who has delved into many businesses and become successful outside of what she originally started doing. And of course, Morgan Debon is someone I really look up to because she started her um, business while she was a college student as well. And now she's an angel investor to organizations that are valued at over a billion dollars. And fingers crossed, I hope that I could be someone that other young entrepreneurs look up to one day. So to tell you a little bit more about me, I'm a sophomore at Rutgers University and I'm majoring in cognitive science with a minor in digital communication, information and media. I have always been curious about psychology and human behavior and why people do what they do. So I decided that I wanna go into a field called user experience where they really take that research to figure out how to implement processes that make people's um, user experience or digital 
um, experiences a lot easier. One example of that would be like the skip intro button when you turn on your Netflix show, that's user experience at work. Um, but all around, I just love um, seeing people thrive and uh, helping people win in whatever they do. I'm really passionate about other people and community service. So that's why I included, I've been on two mission trips um, and all around, I just love um, to serve people. So to talk a little bit more about the numbers, my average cakes are $100, but I offer more than cakes, which is why I say that my profit margin ranges from 60 to 70%. Um, I had, like I mentioned before, I had over $5,000 in revenue last year. And what I do with all of my profit is I just invest it right back into my business. I haven't received any external investment um, yet, but I recently this year um, received credit. So that way I can, you know, stretch the bandwidth a little of how much I'm willing to spend on getting quality products and ingredients for my customers. I think it's frozen for a second. Okay, so just to wrap up with some of my goals for my business where I hope to be, I would love to move to um, a commercial kitchen and dining space so that way I can prepare more um, for my customers because the demand is definitely there. I would love to host a pop-up shop, um, which is like a bakery kind of one day in the making. Um, I would love to build my team. I'm currently a team of 1.5, myself plus a part-time assistant. Um, and I wanna build a process where people can replicate what I do so that I can produce more. And I hope to see Baked by Airy in various locations across the countries, maybe eventually a corporation stores, shipping. I have received a couple of requests for do I ship already, but I want this to be something that grows outside of myself and my vision and Thanks, into Biden. other people's states and towns. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Ari. And uh, so now we're going to um, set another 10 minute timer and judges, you will have the floor um, to ask Ari any questions that you want. So Andrea, if you would start a 10 minute timer for us, it'd be much appreciated. Yep. Hey, Ari, that was it. Oh, that was a great presentation and I'm very hungry now. Um, <laughs> they're beautiful. So uh, when you're saying you have a 60 to 70% profit margin, are you talking about just versus, you know, what you're selling it, taking out the costs of goods, you, you know, ingredients and things you paid for, or are you also paying yourself for the hours that you work? Yeah. So my profit margin, um, what I charge includes the ingredients that um, I have to purchase to make the cakes and other things like my mixers, um, some packaging items, as well as the time, of course, that I invest. Um, like I said, I have a part-time assistant, so I do take that into account because I do have to um, compensate that person as well for their labor in my business. Great. Thank you. You mentioned... Uh the four goals you're working on. I was wondering, how do you um, prioritize those projects you're working on? Um, well, I would say the prioritization of my goals is based off of the demand and response that I'm getting from my customers. Um, I, I, in a way, ordered them in how important they are and in terms of time. I would say right now, um, building a team is most important to me because if I have more people who are able to replicate what I can do, then I don't have to turn down um, as many customers and say, sorry, I'm fully booked or I'm not available for this week. Um, following that, once I do have the team, of course, um, you know, people say too many hands in the pot spoil the broth. So I would love to move to a larger commercial space where we have more room to work and serve people. All right, this is terrific. I'm, my first question as was pretty similar to the last one was, um, you know, if I want to order, do you guys offer gluten-free? I saw on the website, you have dairy-free and vegan, but need to know about gluten-free. The other question is about in terms of the secret airy spice that is going to be maintained as you scale, if you move to a larger manufacturing um, production site, how do you maintain the quality over time as you grow? 
Yeah, those are two really good questions. Um, to answer your first question, um, even though it's not mentioned specifically, I do say that if anyone has any dietary restrictions, um, they could let me know and I could, you know, tweak a recipe to meet that need. Um, I have people in my family who are dairy free, gluten free, so I totally understand and want to be able to make sure that I can serve those people as well. But in terms of um, my process and replicating what I can do, um, another one of my goals that I did not mention before is I would love to long term have something like a Betty Crocker cake mix or Duncan Hines, where um, what my uh, my recipe can like be picked up right off the shelves. You know, the three eggs, just add water, three eggs, oil, and then you have the same taste each time. So I think that's one way that I'll be able to make sure all my cakes uh, come out the same, even if they're not all baked by airy per se. Thank you. Um, I just have first, those are probably the best cakes I've ever seen. <laughs> I'm yeah. a big sweets person. And I would say it's almost like an artistry as well. Um, yeah. What it, in like the past year, what's probably been your biggest challenge in, in serving and, and being an entrepreneur, uh, dealing with multiple, you know, personalities when you're when you're providing a product like that? Um, well, I would definitely say um, being a student as well, time management is definitely something that I've had to confront every single day in terms of, um, oh, I have this many finals coming up this week, so I can only take this many orders and I have to communicate that on my page that say, oh, I'm fully booked this weekend, sorry. Um, but I would say since I am a newer um, entrepreneur, one of the challenges that I've been struggling with is money. Um, I at first, I would actually spend more than I made, which I think is something that happens along the journey in each person trying to be an entrepreneur. But thankfully, um, with some of the support of my family members, especially my dad, who's really into business and numbers, um, I am able to now have a good profit and make sure that you know I'm getting a good return on my investments. Can I ask a question? How did you benchmark your pricing and what is involved in other aspects such as delivery and the other things aside from the particular product price? Okay, so my pricing is consist of how much um, the ingredients cost, of course, because I have really um, specific and unique flavors that does vary. So if you're ordering, let's say, a cookies and cream and Swiss meringue cake, that's going to cost more than a regular um, chocolate cake with chocolate frosting. Um, like I mentioned before, I do have to compensate myself and whoever is working with me for their time. So that's involved in the pricing. Um, I aspire to give my customers like a high end experience. So the type of packaging and marketing materials I use are, you know, a little more high end than what you would get at your you know, regular white box at the grocery store. So that's involved, um, especially because I do buy those from out of the country. And then, um, of course, I have my materials that I get, um, a mixer, uh, different types of uh, supplies and things like that. So all of that, um, my pricing takes that into account, as well as comparing what other bakers in New Jersey are, are charging for their cakes. Um, I noticed um, over the pandemic, you know, quite a few people, you know, starting uh, at home baking, you know, beautiful cakes. It's beyond me. I, I can't, I make a box cake and I consider it a day, but, um, but I, I'm curious, how do you differentiate yourself? Like that's, that's the thing, like you said earlier that these cakes look at, as good as you look on the day you're celebrating. And I thought like, oh, cakes worth celebrating. That's cool. But like, there's so many out there. How do you think that you can stay ahead of the competition and break through that? Well, like you mentioned before, it's kind of like an artistry. So the design of my cakes is also um, something that stands out within the area. All my cakes that have flowers, I actually use fresh flowers instead of artificial ones. But aside from how my cake looks and tastes, I want it to be an entire experience. So even from ordering it with me, whether you pick it up for delivery, everything is packaged almost like um, a gift. So this is something like 
So whoever's celebrating feels like there's something extra special about this. You know, when you go to the grocery store, your cakes, it comes in like a super loud plastic and it's a hassle having it at the restaurant. All my cakes comes in like these tall, nice boxes with a ribbon and bow. So I really want it to be from the time you order to the time you pick it up, open it up, enjoy it to be a full experience. So it's it's more than just, oh, I bought a cake. Like I bought an experience as part of my birthday or my wedding, et cetera. Thank you. So what would you be doing if you're not an entrepreneur? Um, honestly, I would say I'd probably be doing uh, this, but not as often. Baking was still a hobby for me before I started a business. So um, I would continue that. But another um, avenue I'm involved in is social media and digital marketing. I did mention um, a little bit on the slide about me that I am a social media manager. So I help small businesses and um, bloggers on Instagram curate and create content, um, create content calendars and promote um, whatever their niche is on Instagram. So because my business has been growing the way the rate it has, um, I've slowed down on that a little bit, but if I wasn't an entrepreneur, I'd probably be more involved um, online in the digital space. So well, I have a challenge for you. For the next Valentine, you're going to get an order of our cakes. I'm not going to finance the delivery of that. Um, well, that is why actually during um, Valentine's Day weekends and um, public holidays, I only offer um, specific items. So for example, Valentine's Day weekend, I only offer my cupcake bouquets, um, a specific cake um, that is shaped like conversation hearts. I don't know if you remember those candies, as well as chocolate covered strawberries, because those three are the most popular things people like to order for Valentine's Day. And they're, they're not customizable, so I can make a bunch of them in less time and less energy. Um, in terms of delivery, if it was a different weekend, I do offer um, delivery with a price um, determined by how far it is. And you have just a few couple seconds, um, so we are going to wrap up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, judges, you will have six minutes to work on your evaluations. Um, and Ari, you are, are welcome to stay um, in the main room, watch the other presentations. But if you want to go back to the competitor room, um, there's, I guess, not a lot of people there now, but uh, just tell Steve and he'll move you back there. All right. Thank you all for your time. There's about to be just one in that room in a second when we're done. Thank you.
Judges, two minute warning. Judges, one minute warning. I'm going to bring Hassan in. Hey, Hassan, if you want to share your screen. Time is up. Hassan, if you want to share your screen, I will go ahead and make you the presenter. Thank you. How's and everyone doing? You can get set up. Good. Hassan, you'll, you'll have two minutes to set up, and then when you're ready, uh, mm -hmm. you'll tell us, and then Andrea will start at 10 minute clock for your presentation, okay? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Your banner needs a mirror change, my friend. Sorry? What's your Dr. Floss is backwards, at least on the side thing. Oh, uh, it's, it's not backwards for me. Oh, on, on his like, spotlight. You mean, oh, for yeah. me, it's not backwards. I'm not sure what's going on. Apologies right. for the technical interruptions. My bad. No, don't worry about it. Zoom has a setting to flip stuff. Uh, you're, I wouldn't sweat it, but... Uh, uh -huh. Th thanks for letting me know. <laughs> I'll keep it. No worries. Got it. Um, may I start? Uh, okay. All right, Andrew, if you could start the clock for us on, that'd be appreciated. Yep, the clock is starting now. Floor is yours, sir. Got it. Thank you for this opportunity. I truly feel humbled to be here. Did you know the World Health or Organization estimates that over 2.3 billion people worldwide suffer from dental diseases, many that could have been prevented with habitual dental hygiene. Hello, esteemed judges and fellow entrepreneurs. My name is Hassan Gashif and I'm a senior at Montclair State University as a biology major on the pre-dental track. Over the years, I have shadowed many dentists and while working under them, I saw a common theme among patients who had gum diseases simply due to lack of flossing. Thus, I innovated a new way of flossing. Gum and Gums is a sustainable oral hygiene brand which has innovated a new way of flossing through its autonomous cleaning medical device called Dr. Floss. A while back, I went through a traumatic incident when my hygienist started yelling at me for develop, developing cavities due to lack of flossing. Truth be told, I was too embarrassed to tell her that I did not know how to floss despite being a dental student. One fine morning, while I was playing with the piece of dental floss, I tried to floss two teeth at once. 
to save time before getting to class. And there I felt a euphoric sensation, which made me wish if only there was a device which could floss all at once. And there Dr. Floss was born. Let me tell you a bit about the problem and then I'll explain how Dr. Floss solves it. New research from the American Academy of Periodontology found people who don't floss their teeth risk contracting gum diseases such as periodontitis and even heart disease. Currently on the market, there are two categories of flossing. The economical category consists of low-tech products which are made up of toxic PFAS chemicals which make your gum sensitive and bleed and even puts consumers risk for cross-contamination. On the other hand, high-tech products are not only expensive but are made for extreme diabetic patients and in fact not even improved by dentists. While, while most people don't bother flossing due to the time and effort required, the rare ones who do end up being counterproductive as they end up damaging their gums permanently with incorrect techniques. Dr. Floss was solved to create, uh, solved to solve these problems as by occupying a unique middle ground by being a high tech, low cost product solution that combines efficiency and effectiveness. We cater to low tech users who want a more effective tool and the high tech users who want a faster method of flossing. In addition, we, we uh, cover entirely new categories of users, what we call access users, limited access users. Those who have traditionally avoided flossing due to sensory, mobility, disability, or cognitive reasons, which include senior citizens, neurodivergent individuals, amputees, and folks with other special needs. Dr. Floss is an all-at-once flossing device, which you can simply pop in and out of your mouth. This is a demonstration. The ergon Dr. Floss is the world's first one-size-fits-all solution. The ergonomic design allows you to fit any mouth shape size with its flexibility. Dr. Floss is made up of two parts, the, the reusable base and a set of disposable threads, which hooks on and off easily. Unlike the rest of the industry who uses cheap and toxic plastic, Dr. Floss will be made with biodegradable material and eco-friendly packaging so that we can move the industry to a sustainable future. Did you know last year, CDC reported 80% of Americans suffered from gingivitis and periodontitis, which despite being preventable diseases have become prevalent among our society. Every one in four people have died due to causes related to oral hygiene and heart, heart, heart diseases. Putting aside the numbers, Dr. Floss is a hybrid product which meets the needs of the, of the United States. As reported by the American Dental Association, 100,000 people per capita, there are only 61 dentists who can serve them. Access to oral health is a global crisis as those numbers keep getting worse uh, with a population of 7.5 billion people on this planet and soaring and only on the supply side, only 1.5 million dentists to help them. Hence, hybrid devices like Dr. Floss are used as a safety net as an average person can help themselves with a solution which is easy, fast, and effective, safeguarding the large population from oral gum disease. According to some of the top industry reports, the United States dental floss market is alone worth $750 million, while the global market is expected to grow up to 4.9 billion by 2025 with a positive CGR rate of five and a half percent. North America alone holds 35 percent of the market. On, on top of that, uh, personal care brands are also carrying oral hygiene products, in particular uh, cocoa floss, such as case in point being Safari and many others among them. As, as the personal care is worth $44.5 billion. 
Currently, we have finalized a working prototype, which has been turned into a manufacturing design with our sign manufacturing partners. We hold a provisional patent, at which as through our manufacturing partners, we hold a provisional patent, which as we speak is being turned into a non-provisional patent. Some of the top dental schools of the country, such as Columbia, Rutgers, and NYU, have agreed to publish white papers on our product. Similarly, interest from the industry has also been shown, as I was fortunate enough to speak with, uh, with the president of Henry Schein, Mr. Steve Kess, and alongside with their chief uh, head dentist, Dr. Bruce. For those of you who do not know what Henry Schein is, Henry Schein is a global distributor of healthcare products. Since they work closely with industry giants like Colgate's, there some, some doors could be potentially opened with the talks being had. Our innovation has also received monetary validation by winning pitch competitions worth $25,000 and recognition for the best startup idea award in 2021. I have been fortunate enough to be affiliated with some of these prestigious cohorts and organizations. Currently, we plan on selling a pack of 60 units for $25 through a subscription model. If we win, we plan on allocating uh, uh, the resources to mold making uh, and uh, uh, getting a sample run uh, uh, with our, as a marketing strategy. And we also plan on securing our uh, patent uh, very soon. One of our near-term goals is to obtain FDA ADA approval for consumer satisfaction, even though it is a class one medical device, which means that it does not require any regulation. Furthermore, we plan on partnering with Santa Fe, which is a nonprofit subsidiary group of Henry Schein for charitable donations by giving Dr. Floss back to the community, which it most needs. Well, why trust us? Why can we make this happen? Well, I come from a diverse background of experiences. As a first generation Pakistani immigrant who has been fortunate enough to compete in the model United Nations and as a lead as the president of the pre-dental club. Alongside my, comp I, I have a diverse board of advisors uh, which includes specialty dentists and a venture capital and private equity investor. On the R&D side, I have led some of the top global product design firms uh, uh, from end-to-end -end consulting. Thank you for your time. We would love to send you samples if you can provide uh, us your information by the end of today. And I'd like to open the floor for any questions. All right, T terrific, Asan. Thank you so much, um, uh, Andrea. If you wouldn't mind setting the timer to ten minutes, and judges, um, the floor is yours for Q and A. Okay. Um, Hassan, maybe a terrific presentation and, and such a great idea it makes me think, of course, of Invisalign and how that revolutionized braces. This is, you know, kind of very similar to that. But um, are you the the sole investor in this? Do you have other people investing in this? How is this going to work for you from a financial standpoint? So, so currently we haven't raised any capital because, um, because of the uh, seed money we won through pitch competitions. So currently we've been self-sustained. Um, so um, we would like to raise capital once we, uh, once, you know, um, we produce uh, more samples and, you know, some sales for traction. Well, that's wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you. Hassan, I was wondering if um, you have any mentors on your board. It seems like you have a great diverse board of, of industry professionals. Have any of them put products through the FDA before? Because that seems like it's, it's quite a challenge, I know, from where I'm sitting mm -hmm. <laughs> to get that done. And it could be helpful to have insiders there. Absolutely. So, um, so I was part of a National Science Foundation cohort. Uh, with Rutgers. And um, um, so through that board, some of my uh, mentors who are dentists who've been through that and who've been through that entire process. And alongside that, like I mentioned, for um, Rutgers, Columbia, and NYU Dental School, 
research departments have agreed to you know take this on board and you know then we can uh, go uh, with that and by the way in in, in terms of uh, regulation since dental floss is considered a class one medical device it doesn't require regulation even though we do plan on uh, getting it for consumer satisfaction good to know thank you how much testing have you done on the product um so this has been uh, through you know uh, several dental clinics um, in, you know, the R&D phase alongside, you know, our product design partners. Um, and further on, the purpose of producing those white papers is to, uh, is to produce, uh, publish results uh, publicly, along, you know, comparing it to, uh, you know, other, other products uh, in the market. It seems like a great product. I was wondering, you said the threads are replaced. How long does it take somebody to swap out those threads between uses. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so basically, the uh, uh, the threads are supposed to be disposable. So, a one-time use. Um, so, the reason why you cannot reuse the threads is because if you have, uh, medically speaking, if you have bacteria in your teeth, you do not want to cross contaminating by reusing them again. So that's why it's made disposable. Disposable. Yeah. And and then, how long does it take somebody to? to swap out the threads or, oh. or you just dispose it entirely. Oh, it's a, I can show you. It's, it's like, it's a matter of seconds, you know, you open and you close, you know, as simple. Okay. okay. So on, as far as the, the vision of the business, you mentioned that there's a similar mold, but it's not made of sustainable materials. Is that correct? Yes. So, um, so that's one of our competitors who are, are custom made. So, so, so our, our standard size, you know, so we're a separate category. Um, so they're they're like indirect competitors. So one of the reasons why theirs wasn't a success is because it costs about around three hundred dollars. It takes two weeks uh, to make. First, you have to send a mold, and you know, it's just it's a hectic process. So that's why we made it standardized. So um, you know, it's available off the shelf. But as far as uh, maybe I misunderstood uh, you you're saying that um, your competitors, you're saying you're sustainable, your model is and, and friendly, environmentally friendly. Is, did I misunderstand that? Yes, um, so, so they use um, you know, um, uh, uh, cheap plastic uh -huh. while we're using biodegradable materials such as bamboo, silk, and you know, other materials. Um, yeah. That's why we're sustainable. Yeah, and do, do any other competitors like you use um, sustainable no. materials as well? So no. you're the only one that offers sustainable materials? In Absolutely. The and especially some of the um, bigger industry giants who, you know, make, uh, you know, who have like billions in revenue, they're infamous for, uh, for using it, for having like toxic, you know, PFAS chemicals, which has been reported by, you know, uh, the media time and time again. So wow, you left them speechless, huh? We still have a uh, we still have a few minutes for Q and A. If anybody uh, has another question they'd like to ask, I, I have a question. Um, have you spoken to uh, you know say the the person who created Invisalign? I think that was uh, like a college project or or something to begin with, wasn't it? Yeah. So many many of our um, you know um, uh, dental partners ha have. Um, in fact, recommended me to, you know, go to them. So, um, you know, there's not just Invisalign, you know, there are other competitors like Smile Direct Club or, you know, even, you know, these um, uh, Oral-B or Colgate. Um, so, you know, we have had talks with Henry Shine, we're a global distributor who works with Colgate and others alike. Um, however, um, you know, as of right now, you know, I'm trying to take this, uh, you know, by myself. But in the future, yeah. Do you have a, a patent or a trademark, Harris? I don't know what he's supposed to have. Yes. So we have it. We have a provisional patent, which is being converted into a non-provisional. So yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. If there are no more questions, then um, judges, we will start a six-minute clock. If you could fill out feedback for Hassan, that would be great. Hassan, um, you're welcome, and uh, hopefully you will stay around in the main room and uh, 
there'll be one more presentation and then uh, you guys will have a chance to do some Q&A with the judges. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time, guys. Thank you. Judges, this is your two minute warning.
I'm going to go ahead and bring in our last contestant. Takes one minute. Thank you. You got it, man. Hey, Alex, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Um, our judges are just finishing up, and then we're going to give you two minutes to, you know, put your presentation on screen and get yourself set, and then we will start the clock, okay? All right. Thank you very much. You are very welcome. Judges, you should be wrapping up. Alex, if you want to go ahead and share your screen and start prepping, you can do that now. All right, thank you very much. Sure. We can see your presentation. You might want to maximize your screen, maybe. Okay. Up there. There you go. Now it's picking in my face. Well, I like it. All right. Alex, you ready to go? You want another minute? Um, I think I'm ready. Just let me pull up. Yeah, no, no worries. Timer. You got another minute if you need it. Okay. You let us know, okay? Yep. Um, but I think I am ready now, so I guess we can start right. whenever you guys are ready. Andrea, if you would start the 10-minute timer for Alex. Alex, the floor is yours. So hello, everyone. My name is Alex Simeon. I'm an 18-year-old freshman at the University at Rutgers University of New Brunswick, and I'm the founder and CEO of Quizala, an online e-commerce platform connecting people to their culture through specialty foods. I would like to start by saying thank you for this amazing opportunity and to Mr. Kieran Flanagan for helping me and preparing for today, as well as my team over at Quizala for, my, for their help as well. I'll begin by asking a simple question. What is entrepreneurship? Is it making a company or make, coming up with an idea to, that helps solve a problem or selling something that you make a quick buck off of? All of these definitions are absolutely true and they all hold some validity. But to me, entrepreneurship is something more. It's something different. It's a lifestyle. It's a way of carrying yourself every day and identifying problems in everyday life, as well as creating solutions or making things that make an impact. These are all things that make an entrepreneur an entrepreneur. And to me, this is how I've been living ever since fourth grade with the creation of my first company, Crunchers. So I have a sweet tooth um, and in fourth grade, I wanted to make a company that sold sweet goods or baked goods or something in that general space. But I realized that in order to be successful in this space, I'd have to stand out. So this led me to create a new product that wasn't sold by any other company or restaurant. I called it the Cruncher. It was simply a piece of toasted sliced bread with a layer of any sweet spread like peanut butter or Nutella and topped with any breakfast cereal. It was simple, it was easy, and quite frankly to me at the time, it was delicious. But although I had made a menu with various items and Cruncher combinations, it didn't really pan out how I intended. Next, there was Charger. At this point in my life, I had just joined my school's Mall United Nations Club and have been discussing very extremely, extremely important issues like climate change and fossil fuel consumption. I'd also been following the rise of Tesla and its electric vehicles, realizing that this was a great solution in reducing and combating fossil fuel usage, but it was limited by its charging infrastructure. I understood that in order for people to trust and switch over from gasoline powered cars, they'd have to trust a network that would support them. And at that point, charging simply wasn't as good as it is now. So I created Charger, a charging network that would help support electric vehicles of all kinds interoperably and would generate power through solar panels. Understandably, this idea didn't really work out because as a middle school student, you're limited by time, by money, and really just by growing up. But more recently, I founded my first real company called Tremers in the middle of the pandemic in late 2020. 
Tremors was a platform designed to give people a place to travel virtually and simultaneously purchase goods that would help in representing those experiences from vendors from all over the world. Smaller artists and musicians and other vendors in touristy areas all over the world were struggling immensely during the pandemic, as a result to little to no tourism. This platform was made to help them out and give them a place to connect with tourists and to make money. I wanted to create a product that would simulate the action of traveling to a new place, learning about its people, its culture, its history, while supporting those people as well. However, I was unable to see out my vision for the product because of critical issues like trying to make it appealing for users, creating immersive content for the users to actually interact with, among other things. But it was a great experience nonetheless. But when looking at my life and where I've come, I can, under, I've, I can see that there are two main things that have, given me, that have given me a really new experience in life, failure and opportunity. Although all of my ventures and past ideas have died and led to nothing of note, they did give me the opportunity to refine and learn new skills as an entrepreneur. But beyond my growth as just an entrepreneur, I also grew as a person throughout my time. In high school, I graduated with a 397 GPA and, and excelled in, and I was on the honor, honor roll for all four years of high school. Additionally, I was ranked as the 23rd best public forum debater in the state of New Jersey, as well as the highest ranked debater in my school's history. But beyond high school, I transitioned well into college where I attend the business school at Rutgers University in New Brunswick, and I currently have a 3.3 GPA and 26 credits as a freshman, and participate in the Rutgers Entrepreneurial Society, as well as the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Living Learning Community. All of my experiences have led me to my current company, Quazala. So Quazala is your go-to global marketplace for specialty food items and goods. It's your one-stop shop for the foods that are hard to find in your everyday life. Simply, we're in the business of connecting people to their culture through food. But why Quazala? Well, Quazala is important for a few, few main reasons. The three main reasons as to why Quazala is, is a wonderful solution to the current state of the specialty foods market is because we're designed to improve accessibility. The first reason is that there's a clear and surprising lack of user-friendly and centralized platforms. Right now, people use platforms like Amazon, Etsy, or Walmart to purchase these goods, but they aren't really designed for specialty foods. Thus, they do not cater to these vendors and customers. The alternative are smaller platforms who do cater to this group, but only in niche subsections, meaning that they only cater to one culture. This is not convenient, and most of the time, these platforms have poor user experiences. The second reason relates to brick and mortar stores. For starters, they're on the decline and are rapidly shutting down, a trend only exacerbated by the pandemic. Additionally, they have limited customer bases, meaning that they're limited to the people within their immediate vicinity, as well as having a limited inventory meaning that they can only carry what their physical store can hold. Lastly, because our vendors are small, small businesses and stores, we act as an online store that grants them the opportunity to sell their products online for free. If they don't have the resources to create an online website or storefront themselves, Quazala is a great solution that allows them to do so for free. But you may be wondering how Quazala works. Well, Quazala works similar to any other e-commerce platform, but with a slight twist. Quazala functions on two fronts. Our vendors upload food products to our platform and have access to tools to help manage their shop, and our customers browse, shop, and explore the food product listings on the website. For both parties, the experience on Quazala is designed to be as easy and straightforward as possible. And upon every product sale, we take a 3% commission fee. But on the same note, I'm going to talk about how Quazala makes money, and we do so in two main ways at this stage. Our, 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 three, our, our commission fee and our, and our promoted product service. Upon the sale of every product, Quazala takes a small 3% commission fee, and this is our main revenue stream. Compared to other competitors like Amazon or Etsy who charge to list products and then a commission fee on top of that, we have a significantly cheaper model for our vendors because we're not in this for just pure revenue, but to connect people. And we believe that this model of structuring will lead to a healthier relationships with our vendors and will lead to more immediate growth. As for our secondary revenue stream, our promoted product service, we will charge vendors for advertising their product listings on the platform. This price will be determined by what advertisement goals the vendor wants to hit, and my team will work closely with these vendors and help them during this entire process. In terms of the company's timeline, we are currently, with, we are currently in our vendor onboarding process. This process includes mass email campaigns, phone calls, and in-person meetings with vendors. We are focusing on vendors at this point and in the beginning to ensure that we are ready for launch, because we want to make sure that we have a large variety of products that are available and ready for our customers to browse when we do fully launch. After our launch, we intend to implement our social media campaigns and to continue our vendor onboarding process to ensure and to maintain platform growth. 
overall, Kuzala is something that I'm extremely, extremely, is extremely important to me. And it's really um, kind of culminated as like the pinnacle of everything that I've done so far. I'm extremely passionate about it, and I hope that you see its potential as well. Kuzala has an extremely bright future ahead, and I hope to create a vibrant community and a platform that connects you to your culture and to your food, while giving you that indescribable taste of home. If you'd like to see Kuzala right now, the platform is live and you can check it out at kuzala.com or simply scan the QR code at the top left of your screen. Overall, I'd just like to say thank you very much for this amazing opportunity and I'm ready for questions. Okay, Alex, thank you so much. Um, so Andrea, if you wouldn't mind starting the uh, Q&A clock, we'll have 10 minutes of questions and answers and judges, it is uh, in your hands. Hey, if I can start, so uh, first, thank you for the presentation. I'm not that, that clear about the business model. Uh, you mentioned taking commission, but yeah. uh, who is going to be responsible for the delivery and the cost of the delivery? Yeah, so the way Quazala works is that we are simply just a platform that connects people to their vendors. So basically, we're just like a middleman, if you can think of it like that. So in terms of delivery and product management, that's all happening on the side of the vendor. So we just simply act as this online front for them to actually connect with the customers. So what Quazala does is that we have a shipping algorithm that, that automatically calculates um, how much it would cost for a vendor to ship a product out to a customer. So we're making the process as seamless as possible. And we're also, we also implemented that tool as well because shipping is a really, really costly thing for small businesses when it, when it comes to share, sharing their products with other people. So we made sure that we had this tool ready for our, our vendors to ensure that when they do want to start selling their products online, they don't really run into that roadblock of having to pay massive prices when it comes to shipping. So basically, when you think about it overall, Quizala is just a platform that connects people. And upon that 3% commission fee that you spoke about, um, every time a product is purchased, we take 3% out of that. So upon every individual product sale, we take 3%. Right. So, so yeah. as competitors, uh, Walmart and Amazon, but what about companies that provide solution for digitalizing uh, stores? Uh, you know, it's all the, also direct competition. Yeah, so there are online platforms like Shopify or, and stuff like that who do grant people to make their own websites. And that's not really our, comp our competition because right now, if you look at the specialty foods market, a lot of those stores are either brick and mortar locations, meaning that they don't have an online front. And if they do have an online front, those stores, as I said before, they only cater to one subsection of a culture. So they might cater to Indian culture or African culture or Caribbean culture. But when you want to find these products in one place, you cannot do that right now. So that's kind of where we separ we stand out from pretty much like an Amazon or an Etsy or a Walmart, because we one, we give these people, these smaller businesses, an opportunity to sell for free. And secondly, we give people, customers, an opportunity to go to a place and a platform that has all of those goods in one place. Thank you. As you said, your commissions are much less than other marketplaces, which are typically around 12 to 15 percent for like Amazon and Walmart. But you're taking the credit card charge, so you have to pay a payment processing fee. What kind of fee, if you're only charging three percent commission, what, what kind of fees do you expect to pay for like payment processing? Yes. Yeah, so for our platform, we utilize Stripe. Um, as our backend payment processing, and they only charge for every upon every transaction. I think it's like 0.0001% of every transaction. So the fees are really minimal. So we don't really have to worry about that at this point. But as we continue to scale, those are going to exponentially grow. But by the time that actually happens, we'll be able to kind of um, increase our, our, I guess it's when it comes to Stripe, you can pay to kind of waive these fees. So when we get to the point where traffic is really large and those transaction fees are, do increase, that's when we're gonna start looking at trying to figure out how we can kind of waive those at, the, at that point in time. But right now, transaction fees are really minimal and we do not have to worry about them. Alex, this is really cool um, to have, be able to find everything in the same spot. Do you have a sense that sites like GoPuff wouldn't be interested in this or how, how would you stop someone like them who already has a stronghold in the market from just saying, okay, we're gonna seek out vendors who are um, from more culturally specific backgrounds? Yeah, so there are, um, I, as we've begun our vendor onboarding process, we've learned that there are competitors like GoPuff or DoorDash and other places that have tried to do this. But what's yeah. interesting is that one, the people that they these uh, larger companies go to do not make it so that these, these vendors have a really enjoyable experience whatsoever. And that was something that I didn't really know is because 
these companies, these larger corporate companies, they kind of take advantage of these people and they kind of make it so that these smaller brick and mortar stores, these smaller brands don't really have an enjoyable experience trying to sell their products online. And as um, I've been trying to vendor, uh, reach out to vendors, I've run into some issues where they're like, hey, we've tried to sell our products online with these other companies and just the process was not enjoyable whatsoever. So they've kind of shit shied away from actually selling them online. So what we offer is a really kind of home style, home feeling um, place where they can actually sell their products for, extra, for um, prices that are really not comparable to our competitors because we don't really focus on just profits like our competitors do, but more or less by we focus on connecting people and just developing a platform. Yeah, that's terrific. Definitely get testimonials from the vendors if that's the case, if that's a key differentiator to use those to onboard other vendors as well. All right, thank you. Yeah. Alex, do you tend to warehouse product? Or if I have my shopping cart that has five different products from five different vendors, um, am I going to be hit with five different shipping fees? How does that exactly work? Yeah, so right now um, we have a really low overhead, so we don't actually have like the money to actually have the same kind of shipping infrastructure as an Amazon or eBay like that. But right now, when you do have um, five products from five separate vendors, we actually calculate, as I said before, um, how much it would actually cost to get the source of those products as cheaply as possible from each vendor to you. Um, and that's all going to be calculated into one price when you pay out, when you check out. But on the back end, we actually calculate um, how much each how much each goes to each vendor so it's all simple and it's all like um, really um, not as uh, costly for the customer because again shipping is really um, kind of a roadblock that we ran into at the beginning but we've kind of found a way to work around it and make it so that it's not as um, limiting to um, not only our vendors but also to our customers how do you um, thank you for this presentation how do you um, plan to have more specialty food companies from different cultures find out about you? Yeah, so right now we are working, because um, my team is kind of spread out um, across the country since we all kind of just went to spread out to our different colleges. Um, so right now we're, our vendor onboarding process is mostly done in person, but we've also been just doing a lot of cold calling, which has um, led to um, quite a few returns, return calls and interest in the platform. Um, as well as to writing out emails and a really powerful tool that we begin to use um, is social media, because obviously during this time, that's kind of how most businesses are really run effectively through social media. Um, and that's a really big platform that we've been able to use more recently to get more traction. Um, but when we, but after we start launching, we want to continue to use social media because it's such a powerful tool um, to actually um, gain attraction to vendors. Um, and after that point, we want to, I want to develop a team that goes out and actually sources vendors um, in person when the company is at a stage enough to a strong enough stage to do that. So um, I just, I went on your website earlier today. I thought it was really good and I was happy to see my favorite foreign product on there from my homeland. But um, one of the things that I would just, and I'll put this in my notes on the judging sheet. If you haven't been to fancy food show in New York in the summer, they have aisles and aisles by country of different foods and Amazon is tough for those places to sell because they do charge so much. So that might be uh, something to check out kind of all the fish in a barrel there. Awesome, thank you very much. I'll write that down. I was just wondering, uh, Alex, and maybe I missed this, but um, can you share a little bit about your target market, like your ideal client? Who would purchase this and, and how that relates to your revenue model? Yeah. So our target market is really anybody who's interested in specialty foods. When you look at specialty foods, it's not just limited to the people who are from a certain origin country. So for example, I'm from Haiti um, and I know my parents or family friends or family members would want to purchase goods from Haiti. So since we are such a um, expansive and culturally centered platform where we cater to so many people, the person that we are interested in are your people who are interested in cooking those products, people who want to have a taste of their homeland. And the uh, United States is a country made of immigrants, right? So when you look at who we kind of cater to, it's a large population of people who just want to try the food from their back, from their home country. Um, and another group that we um, realize that we are um, catering to are people who just like to cook. People like to try out new foods um, and going to these platforms and just like scrolling for new foods and new ingredients um, is another way 
um, as to how we can grow our customer base as well. So that's another group as to who we're going to cater to as well. Do you have any concern about any friction that might occur on the customer service side or on the return side? You know, Amazon Prime is like a default for a lot of people because they can go to Kohl's and return their stuff without doing anything, really. Um, yeah, absolutely. So is um, there any consideration made to the post-purchase issues that might arise? Yeah, so our return and uh, kind of refund policy is that since a lot of the food products are um, perishable, we can't really return them back to the vendor. But if there is an issue um, in terms Thank of shipping, you. that's going to be insured by the shipping uh, company. I'd just like to say thank you really quick for this opportunity. Um, and just thank you for this entire program. I, this is my first competition, so this is kind of a new experience for me. So thank you. You did great. Thanks for coming. Uh, yeah, you did an awesome job, Alex. I, none of us would have known it was your first presentation unless you told us. Um, all right. So thank you, Alex. And judges, if you uh, would take six minutes and um, do your uh, uh, reviews for Alex and provide feedback, that would be great. And then we will move on.
judges, one minute and 45 second warning. Judges, 30 seconds remaining. All right, whenever you're ready, I have the um, judges set up to go to their room to have a discussion. Okay. All right, so uh, <clears throat> judges, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to come back here at 420. Um, it's a break for most people, except for our hardworking judges. You guys are going to go into a separate room. Um, Mike will be in there with you, and you're just going to review uh, your grades. You have an opportunity to make changes, and uh, we will um, uh, score the winner and the runner-up. So judges, thank you. If you could go in there, uh, much appreciated. And everybody else, if you would rejoin us at 420, it would be appreciated. Hey, I'm gonna, oops, I'm gonna open all rooms. Goodbye, judges. I think you have to accept it, Libby. I have to accept it. Except, I mean? except going into the room. Were you not asked to go to the judge's room? No. <gasps> oh, you're not there yet. Hold on. Try that. How about you, Michael? You either? There you go, Michael. Join the judge's room, please. Thank you. All right. I will be right back. Where did Jariah go? The students are back in a room too. <laughs> Am I supposed to be in, in the student room? Yeah. Doesn't matter. No, you, you can stay here. I'm going to tell them all to come back out of here. I don't know why they're all in there anyway, I guess, because when I open the rooms, automatically threw you back in or threw them back in. But you can hang out here. It doesn't matter. All right. Sounds good. Thank mm -hmm. you for uh, for the opportunity for this. This was uh, this was a really fun time. I enjoyed getting to see everyone else's too. Honestly, you all did an amazing job. That was cool. I'll be right back. Andrew, I'll be right back. I'm going to join the uh, judges' room for a minute.
All right, I think we're ready to welcome everybody back. Uh, hey, everybody. So um, our judges are uh, still deliberating. We are uh, a little bit delayed, but that's a great thing. And uh, just the competition is is so strong um, that, uh, you know, they want to make sure they get it right. So um, we, we're going to I told them to take the time that they need because I want to make sure there's an answer. But um, all of you guys just really phenomenal job and i want you got we're missing two people by the way do we know are they in a breakout room oh wait there's one. Oh, you know what i might just it might just be people not on video hi hi everybody um so i, I want you guys to know uh how, how truly impressed we are with all of you um and also uh that we are, uh, we're going to be here for you guys. Um, there's a lot of resources in this room. I think, as I said, and I'll probably mention it again when everybody gets on, but um, we're going to invite you as soon as we have a live event where we don't have to worry as much about COVID. Um, we're going to invite you, we're going to introduce you to everybody, but your mentors who you've met, the judges who are on this call, we're all resources for you. Everybody who, who um, is on the call today, uh, except for Sarah, who was a previous winner, is a proven entrepreneur, EO member, uh, over uh, a million dollars in revenue, you know, some way over that. And, uh, and we're here for you guys. I have ideas for most of your businesses, as I'm sure other people do. Um, but I, I really encourage you guys to take advantage of that because uh, that, honestly, and, and I, I don't want to sound cliche, but you guys are all winners because you're gonna have the opportunity to really get with a bunch of people who are have, both have the knowledge, but also have the drive to, to help you with your businesses. And they're not gonna ask for anything back because that's just the way uh, the EO members are. So um, congratulations to all of you on a phenomenal job. Um, we're gonna do a judges Q and A, but while we're waiting for them, if you want, I'm happy to answer any questions I can for you. Um, for any of you who don't know, or if I haven't mentioned it, um, I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I, I started my business um, in 1997. 11 years later, I sold it to Price Waterhouse for retirement money. Um, at the time when we sold, we had about 100 people. Um, it was an IT consulting firm. We bootstrapped it the whole way. So um, if you guys have any questions um, you want about your business or my journey or anything, uh, happy to answer them. Larry, um, I'd like to know, were you a technical founder? Yes. Yeah. Um, I started my company because I was very good programmer and very good at running projects. And uh, as I think a lot of companies um, of that kind start that are depending on, dependent on services uh, and then grew it from there. Okay. Have you guys exchanged contact information? Yes. Uh, okay. We're connecting through LinkedIn. Um, you guys will be a fantastic resource for each other. Um, we may, if you want, put together 
what we in EO call a forum, which is kind of a regular meeting. And uh, it's got some structure to it where we share experience with one another. But you guys are part of a very unique club, right? You probably don't know a lot of people at your college who are running business and going to college. So the people who are on this call with you are a great resource for issues, questions, experience that you might be seeking. Um, and and uh, please take advantage of that, stay in touch. And I'll, I'll ask you guys after, if you want us to set up that forum type environment and you know, we can have me or somebody else moderate it, um, let's do that. Um, also, you know, I have thoughts for, for a lot of you with regards to EO members to hook you up with, assuming that they're willing, um, that would have experience that um, may be helpful to your specific product line or your specific business. These guys are really deliberating, huh? Any other questions you guys want to ask? Uh, yeah, I have a, a question. Um, do you have any EO members who are, are specifically well-versed in um, startup funding? Um, yeah. Yeah, there, there, are, uh, <coughs> there are definitely EO members who are well-versed. I've done angel investing. Um, I know other people have done angel investing. I know a lot of resources that I can hook you up with um, who have a lot of knowledge of that. So uh, yeah, start with me, but I can, I can hook you up with other people who I know do uh, a reasonable amount of that, as well as, you know, there's, there's different um, angel groups within New Jersey uh, that, you know, if you wanted to, to speak. Larry, to could you go back to the judge's room so you can then edit the, uh, the documents so we can get the show on the road? Okay. Please. Absolutely. I will go to the judge's room. So now you guys have to ask Steve questions about his business. Ask me questions now. I'll tell you anything you want to know. If it you may have not be true, questions. but I'll tell you. If you have embarrassing questions, that would be great. Just saying. Thank you so much, Larry. It's been a privilege to be a part of this. So thank you for just putting us all onto this opportunity. Thank you. That's all I could say. <laughs> it's all good. I've actually coached. Um, I've been a judge. I've had people go to um, the um, nationals. I had one go to global. So um, this has been a great experience for me over the last seven years as well. It's just, you know, it's nice, fresh to see young minds coming up with new innovative ways to fix problems and solve issues. So it's really cool. Do you have any questions you want to ask me? Um, so I'd like to know, so um, what do you think is the uh, key, like is in uh, when we're talking about pitch competitions, um, you know, especially like EO? What is the key in, 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 in pitching or in the idea or all, all around? Part, um, I mean, uh, in terms of like pitching um, in a competition, like, I mean, you've had successful uh, people who've gone to, you know, uh, national and global. A lot of practice, a lot of practice. you got to hone it down and get it really right. It's got to be succinct. It's got to have good data behind it. It's got to be, uh, if you got a track record and it's proven and it's a, a, um, a product that's actually in service or being used, that has a lot of, of merit to it as well. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of time it's your delivery. How confident are you in it? How well do you deliver the message? And What's the need? What's the viability of it? And is it true entrepreneurship or is it just your front person for the real entrepreneur who's hiding behind the curtain? You know, <clears throat> all of those factors really um, make for a good presentation. You know, but it's really uh, so much of it is just really working hard and putting in the time. <laughs> if you got a good product that, that, especially one that's in the market that's working, that people are buying, that's viable you have good data behind it and you could show that good data then just practice getting your message across so that they understand what you feel inside. And, and, you know, I would want to give you kudos for, for, you know, I know you broke down a little bit at the end, but that sometimes vulnerability is, is not a bad thing. I'm not telling you all to go crying through your presentations. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, <laughs> but yeah, it, 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 it's actually a beautiful thing and it really, People really feel what you feel when that happens. 
So what were your, your highlights and lowlights as a coach versus as a judge? My only low as a coach was that I was given a student with like two weeks to prepare. And I'm a real big um, um, believer in, you know, putting in the time and the effort and the work, the 10,000 hour method. So um, that's the only low. I've not had anything really low about anyone I've ever coached. Uh, I still keep in touch with some of, of, of the students that I've worked with before that had some pretty cool products. Um, and the other question in regards to judging, um, I just felt bad not being able to make everybody win. <laughs> but I really, you know, I've always tried to be totally unbiased whenever I was a judge, you know, and, and just try and give the best, the best uh, score I could to the person I thought really hit all those notes I talked about before I'm presenting. And the judges are back in the house. What's up, fellow judges? Where's Mr. Larry? Are we lose him. Is he going to stay in the breakout room? <laughs> oh, sorry. Can you guys hear me now? Who, Michael? Yes, I'm gonna. Yes, I think Larry's doing yes. the, the uh, calculations and stuff. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. yeah, Larry's. Still in. I'm going to uh, uh, take this lead here. So, number one, first of all, to the students, uh, which I'm going to call it just entrepreneurs. Forget the student moniker for the moment. Entrepreneurs, uh, six of you, congratulations! You guys deserve a round of applause. You guys, are awesome job. Um, very uh, proud. Why Larry's working on some details. This is an opportunity uh, for you to ask the judges any question, just about any question you want. I know a couple came in beforehand, but I'll open it up first before um, we get to the questions. So ask about our journey, thoughts. So would anyone like to start? Um, Mike, would it be helpful to do, sorry, Sienna. Mike, is it helpful to do intros maybe since I don't sure, know? Yes, yes, we've done it in the past. Thank, thank you, Sarah. <laughs> So we should do intros. I will go first. Actually, Dana, I already introduced myself when we were in the competitors room. So I will let, uh, which judge would like to go next? I'm looking at Denise is next on my screen. Hi there, I'm Denise Blasevic. I am the uh, CEO and founder of the S3 Agency. We are a, an advertising agency that helps brands become more well-known and well-loved. And we've had our business for 20, almost 21 years. In March 1st, it'll be 21 years. Mike, pick the next one since you got next one, uh, Darlene. Hello, uh, Darlene Pensita. I own um, a contract research organization. So we manage drug trials uh, for pharmaceutical companies, and we specialize in all women's health products and and infertility. And been in business for eighteen years now. Um, and I'm a scientist more by training and an entre entrepreneur kind of accidental. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Harris. Hi, my name is Harris Wallen. I'm a co-founder of Myers Wallen, which is an intellectual property law firm. Uh, we just celebrated our 15 year anniversary. Um, I've been in this business for about 23 years in various firm sizes, in-house, different companies. Um, and I've been doing this judging, I think, ever since we started. Um, it's been an incredible trajectory of entrepreneurs that has come through these gates. Uh, Kevin. Uh, Kevin Mahoney, um, president and founder of findtape.com. We are primarily an online retailer, been around for 18 years. Um, we also have one brick and mortar store in North Brunswick, New Jersey, um, and primarily ship tape, adhesives, dispensers, um, and we shipped over 65 countries. Excellent. Uh, Libby? Hello, my name is Libby Rothschild. I'm the founder and CEO of Dietitian Boss. You guys can, anyone can connect with me and send me an email. I put it in the chat. I've been in business for four years and I show registered dietitians 
how to start and grow an online business, and I've got a proprietary process. Uh, next is Michael. Hi, Michael Benjimon, owner of MNBIP. We help, uh, we protect the technology and innovation for startup companies. And I'm also an angel investor in uh, startup companies. And uh, the only person I will actually, I, I know Steve is not a judge, but we'll just let Steve tell you what he does. Hi, Steve Furman. I've been a serial entrepreneur for 40 years. I've uh, built, bought, and sold six different companies. Currently, I am now an executive business coach using the scaling up method. And I love GESA. And I'll let Larry introduce himself later. Uh, so let's go, to the let's go to the questions. I know someone was about to ask one. Did you wait? Did you introduce Sarah? Oh, Sarah. Oh, yeah, Sarah. I said you're next. <laughs> Sorry, Sarah. 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 From last year. Michael, I Michael said, Am I next? He said I was next, and then I just asked everyone, Am I? Am I next? But uh, sorry Sarah. about that. It's all good. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Pomerantz. Um, unlike the slide says, I was actually the winner of the 2020 and 2018 on the New Jersey level. So, in all of your seats only a couple years ago, definitely don't have the amazing tenure of my fellow judge panelists, but have been the founder of Sula since 2018, uh, solar water sterilization technology, focusing on uh, providing clean water to families in India. So um, just honored to be here, happy to answer any questions or connect, um, but thank you all entrepreneurs, you were terrific today. Sorry about that, Sarah. I did say you were next and then you, and then I missed you. Uh, the jumping the screen. Okay, so now, now to the questions. <laughs> Someone's about to ask one. Yeah, if I was not, gonna ask one. Um, I feel like today has been amazing to hear everyone's story. And um, even having this opportunity was like a good refresher for me to like remind myself of like my story and like the beginnings and where it came from. So I applaud you all for like just sharing your story with me and with all of us and um, this opportunity. So my question would be to you guys, like with all of this experience that you've had, whether your journey be 10 years, two years, or 21 years, what do you feel is the most significant thing that you've taken from your walk of like entrepreneurship? Hmm. Who are you asking? Whoever wants to start, you can start first. <laughs> I, I, I'll make it real quick, <laughs> real quick and simple. Yeah. Uh, if you truly have a belief in something that you know in your heart of hearts is something you should be doing, never, ever, ever give up. Do whatever it takes. Go for it. Make that one thing your your one thing, and just do it. Do it. Do it until you succeed. Yes. So tenacity. <laughs> there you go. Uh, anyone else like to grab that question too? Yeah, I'll jump in. It's focus. Uh, the, the more that you can focus in on something specifically for your business and for yourself. I think the, the better your chances for success, uh, both as a business and as a human being for having a happy life. I'll chime in. I think if you stay on message and you don't compromise those principles that you value when you start the business and you keep consistent, then you'll just keep growing your business. Um, I think the minute that you start compromising is when things start to go bad. I'll add. I'll add to that. Um, I think uh, I think what I've picked up over the years, and I had a hard time adjusting to, is you know, top is very lonely. Uh, you're you're up there uh, on your your own, and having a support group is key. Um, so I think it took me a while to realize that, but having a, a support group earlier on uh, probably would have been a great advantage to me. I'll add that uh, every entrepreneur is a salesperson and you must master sales. That's uh, everyone, everyone go, anybody else? Um, okay, next question. Um, hi everyone, I wanted to thank you guys again for your time today. Um, it's really been inspiring hearing from all you guys. So, um, all of you have really successful um, businesses and I'm sure you can't do all of it on your own. And like I mentioned in my own presentation, like I'm hoping to grow my team. So what are some um, attributes or characteristics that you would say you look for in people when you wanna 
bring them on to your entrepreneurial journey? I, I can tell you for me, it's it, understanding what your core values are, similar to what, what Harris was saying earlier, and then making sure that you hire based on those core values, not just on someone's skill set. It is uh, down the road, always better. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. You can always train them a skill, but you can't train core values or integrity or, or you know, any of those those features. Either they have it or they don't, or they align with yours or they don't. I would also say share accountability expectations, such that if any member of your team is not being accountable, that you have the ability to have candid conversations about that. Um, Something I learned was um, don't hire friends and family. Um, <laughs> no matter, you know, they can be the best uh, employees for somebody else, but it's, it's hard to manage uh, friends and family. I would say also, I heard a good podcast that Danny Meyer of like Shake Shack, he mentioned he looks for six attributes when he hires, which I think are interesting. The six are kindness, that they're intellectually curious, <clears throat> a good work ethic, empathetic, that they're self-aware and they have integrity. And I thought those six are pretty, pretty good things to look for. And they're not a unicorn either. <laughs> <laughs> um, any, uh, any other questions? I can go, go ahead. Anybody else wanna? Yeah, any, other, any other questions? I can also go to the questions that were sent in before. Yeah, so, I go ahead. Um, so, I mean, again, thank you for this opportunity, but um, I'm just gonna preface my question by saying that like one podcast I'm a fan of is uh, how I built this with Guy Ross. And one question that he typically asks at the end of his entrepreneur, at the end of his interviews is, um, like how much of your journey would you attribute to luck or to skill? And I think that can go to anybody here. So I just wanted to see like what you guys, your guys' take was on that type of question. I would say zero luck. Um, I, I just, somebody does, I don't really necessarily believe in luck. So I, I just kind of map out a path and yeah, it's all, it's definitely all skill, uh, more yeah. seeing opportunity. <laughs> I believe you can make your own luck by putting yourself in enough good situations so that luck can find you. So you want to call that luck or call it abundance or call it the secret, whatever you like. But I think that's really up to you. Again, it's, it's all about ethic. I think I was telling you before, it's in thousand hours. Put in the work ethic. Be there, be present, be part of it and keep always growing, you know? Yeah. I'd agree. I, I've listened to every one of those podcasts too. I love that podcast. And it's like, it seems like all these entrepreneurs are trying to be so like politically correct when they answer. They're always like, oh, 50% luck. I'm like, maybe 10%, but 90%. I mean, I'm still working 60, 70 hours a week. I, I think most of it's hard work. I would agree. I think it's 100% skill. I don't believe in God. I believe in God, not in luck. So sometimes uh, we ask for uh, help from uh, outside of our skill set. But uh, if you can, if you trust on luck, I'm not sure we can go that far. So I think in the context of people giving you advice, they're going to say hard work because luck's out of your control, Alex. So <laughs> it might be luck, but it doesn't really help us to tell you with luck. So this group's going to tell you it's hard work and talent. But I definitely think it's the three. It's like luck, talent, and hard work. Um, and there are plenty of people who didn't have that much of a natural talent, like leap ahead, but work their way to overcome that. And vice versa, people who had head starts with just talent and natural skill, um, that that's just a competitive disadvantage or competitive advantage too. Thank you very much. Super. Um, uh, I, have, I have a question if possible. Yes, go ahead. Absolutely. It's open forum. Yeah. So uh, my question specifically for Sarah. Um, so you're, you're in solar water purification in India, correct? That's, that's your uh, business. Um, that's not like, the sexiest of industries to be in, correct? Serious? What? <laughs> so sexy. So, Ever <laughs> you should see the device she made. Come on. 
It so was. Just, come on, yeah. <laughs> no, you're right. Sure, so that's right. I think I as, just, as I find myself <laughs> in a in a technical industry around something that's not particularly sexy either. How yeah. do you find that you convey uh, your message across to to get uh, you know investors or judges or whomever to, to believe in your, your product and, and get you further ahead? Yeah, it's a good question. I think the best pitches are stories of the art of the possible. Fundamentally, what can the future look like? And that's what you're getting the investor or your audience or your customers to buy into, that they're part of something that's going to create a better future. I think you did a pretty good job of doing that candidly in your presentation but getting really strong on your own brand. You can make the brand sexy, even if the product isn't necessarily. For those who were judges when I was presenting, like I put a lot of effort and my team candidly put a lot of effort into making really clean, crisp slides because of the fact that it isn't necessarily technically the most easy to understand uh, process. We're talking about photocatalysis. I know it's really, it is really sexy just candidly, but um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough thing to get across to your point. So telling that story of what happens, what does the world look like in Jarrah's vision, right? Like if this succeeds, if Biodome succeeds, what's possible? Um, that's always really exciting to people, even if what, you know, how the sausage is made isn't necessarily. Thank you, that, that was very helpful. Absolutely. So we had a couple of questions come in. One of them was, um, what was the best moment you experienced as an entrepreneur? This is for the judges. Can you repeat that, Mike? Um, what is the best moment you experienced, experienced as an entrepreneur? Uh, I think for me, it was the first time that like a major brand called me to, to you know, find out about us and, and possibly give us business that wasn't someone that I knew already. That that was, I mean, there's so many great moments and lots of bad ones too, <laughs> but really the good ones outweigh the bad. Um, and that first one, it was a long time ago, but I will never forget that thinking, wow, like someone who doesn't know me already thinks that we're good. That's cool. Yeah, it's, a, it's, an, it's yeah, I, I can't think of like a, the, my first moment that I thought, wow, I had won the, you know, the Inc. 500, um, and I was number 220 on that list. Um, and that, I just remember being really proud of that for, you know, for a long time. Um, but, you know, and getting office space, getting my first office space, I just felt like, you know, I was, I think I was 33 at the time, and I just felt like, oh, I'm, I'm grown up now. I have office space. <laughs> I'll tell you, for me, is when one of my competitors um, let me know how much they feared or, you know, they were afraid of what we could do in disrupting the industry. And I had no idea that we were feared or reared at all, actually. So that was one of my best moments. For me, for me it was that uh, one of my employees uh, came back from a long vacation and said that the core values she learned at our firm. She was able to carry on to her family and made an impact with her husband and children. So that is a personal compliment that what we make as a business also contributes to families. I would say mine would probably be, um, in 2020, I got to testify before Congress's small business uh, committee as um, they chose like um, three merchants, how like um, they were affected by the Wayfair sales tax decision. And I was one of them. So just testifying before Congress was probably, probably my most memorable. Yeah, I forgot to say we were a famous person in our midst. Kevin's a famous <laughs> person. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm often stopped in the street. <laughs> I will tell you, for me, uh, there's two, but the one that probably is slightly higher. The, first, the second one is about making a difference in, in someone else's future. But the first one was when someone said we couldn't close a large transaction and we signed the papers one day before Lehman and um, Bear Stearns went, right when they went down and we had three months to close. 
and we closed like on December 20, the day after Christmas. And we, um, that was probably the, when they said we couldn't and we just, we just dug deep and we found, we, for those of you, I think Sarah is, is mistakenly a, a New England fan, is that correct? I'm yeah, mistakenly a web fan. A New England Patriots fan, is that correct? I, I am. I don't know about okay. mistakenly. But I'm joking. Yeah. But anyway, the reason why what we use as our motivation, we, we bought the hat from the Giants versus the Patriots that, that said, I bet you, something like it was a hat during one of the Super Bowls that said, kind of said, I bet you can, or something like that. And that's was our motivation. We put it in, the, in front of the table in our meetings. And that's when we, and we, just, we just, just, the question came up. It was sheer perseverance and tenacity that allows us to close the deal. So <laughs> sometimes a no is the best motivation. Uh, next question, uh, and then we're going to wrap it up. And, and any other students, uh, Erie, Hassan, I know you guys didn't get a chance to chat yet. Sienna, any other questions? You guys have? Hey, uh, no, hey Mike. I asked one earlier, but I don't have any more questions. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, just we're, we're supposed to uh, do the winter announcements now. So, um, okay. Go ahead, take it away. All right. Um, this is not a winner announcement. Do you guys seeing my screen? Um, yes. All right. Yeah, just wanted to. Uh, uh, I did really not have a chance to acknowledge. I was supposed to go through these slides. Um, our mentors who worked with all of our competitors. Um, they're all EO members. So uh, for uh, Jara, it was John Chaffee of Design Point. Um, so thank you, John. For um, Sienna, it was Rob Stolker of Hummingbird Sports and Boba Coos and other places. Mm. Uh, for Akash, Jeff Silbert of Hand and Stone. My man. Not break. Uh, for Ari, Joan Fonte of Compass Left. And for Hassan, uh, Ed Delia. And for Alex, Kieran Flanagan of Stone Creek Construction. So thank you so much to all of our mentors. And uh, let's kind of go to the end part. Um, again, we just wanted to say thank you to, uh, to our judges for uh, giving up for your time, for your thoughtful consideration, for your great answers. Uh, it is very much appreciated. I also wanted to thank the team. Uh, we had a pretty remarkable team working for us. We had the godfather of GSEA, Mike Schofel, um, was instrumental as he always is in sharing his expertise and getting things done. Um, Libby, Darlene, Denise, uh, phenomenal. Um, couldn't have done it without your help. Sarah um, helped us quite a bit along the way and helped us to understand young people because we're all old except for Libby, who's uh, less old. Um, Steve, for all the technical stuff. Uh, Andrea, for the timing today. Um, we appreciate it all very much. And with that, we would like to announce uh, our runner-up and our winner. Let me start by congratulating Jara as our runner up. Um, it was a very tight battle. We had a lot of really fantastic entrepreneurs this year, but uh, um, tremendous job. Um, is he on? I can't see him on my screen. Yeah, uh, he's on. Jara's on. I'm looking yes. On. Yeah, I'm here. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and our winner, Akash. Uh, fantastic job. Akash was here last year and uh, he's back this year as a uh, totally different business, a totally different person. Um, so Akash will be representing us at the, uh, the nationals. Um, if for whatever reason, Akash can't represent us, Jara, that would be uh, um, you. Uh, but again, fantastic job to everybody. Um, we will be inviting you to an upcoming EO event. And uh, I'm hoping that all of you can make it. Take advantage of the resources that you met here today. Take advantage of each other as resources. Um, if you guys would like to put together a forum group um, and have one of us moderate it, moderate it um, we'd be willing to do that. 
uh, and uh, Akash and Jarawi will reach out to you with regards to prizes. So um, that concludes the 2022 GSEA Awards for New Jersey. Thank you all so much for your contributions. You guys were great, really. I and very much appreciate it. Also, uh, students too, if there's three dots, you probably know this better than me. In the chat, you can save the chat if you want to get all the contact information of everyone. So whoever does that, <clears throat> click the three dots in chat. Oh, yeah, that and actually is, I'm sorry, Steve. I was gonna say, you should be able to save the chat. <clears throat> So also, so you know, the guys, the competition, you probably know, the competition was live streamed on YouTube. So we should have a recording of the competition. Um, if you would like to forward it to uh, anybody, um, I'll put a link. Actually, I'll, I'll just email you guys uh, the link to uh, the recorded version. I will try to bookmark it, uh, create chapters by person um, if you want to send something more specific. But uh uh, please share it with um, friends, other students, uh, partners, teachers, whoever, parents, obviously, whoever you uh, uh, you would like. Congrats, right. everyone. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank hey, you, everybody. Good job. Good job. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, entrepreneurs. Thank you, judges. Everybody, I am ending the meeting. See you.